And for those who enjoy this channel and would love to support us financially, please feel free to hit that donate link. We'd greatly appreciate it. God bless. Awesome. Thanks so much. We're live. Yes, we're live tonight. Um, guys, we've got a really, really, I think, very um, important broadcast tonight. It's, it's We're going to have a lecture with uh, Salvador here. Um, so uh, beforehand, I want to uh, thank him for uh, giving us his time. Um, we've also got John, Jason, um, and Praise here as well. We're going to be sitting back. If, if we have any questions, we'll do so. We'll have a, a short Q&A. Um, after the fact, this lecture is going to be on uh, junk DNA, ENCO, DNA function. Um, I know Salvador has more of a technical name for it. I'll let him cover that as well. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're really excited for this lecture, Salvador. So thank you for uh, giving us your time tonight. Yeah, thank you. It was awesome. Really appreciate it. I'm really looking forward to it. Well, um, if I could share my screen, um, and I'll, oh. I'll just <laughs> I won't even introduce myself. I'll just just start talking. That's all right with you all. Uh, yeah, of yeah, course. Fun. At, at this everybody point on our channel, you're, yeah, you're 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 no stranger to um, our viewers and listeners. So we really appreciate all the work that you're doing and everything that you teach us. So once again, thanks so much. Can you see my screen? It says 4D nucleome, uh, E4 epitranscriptome. Yes, I can see oh, it. Great. Uh, I, I believe true science is a gift of God. When our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ said, consider the lilies of the valley, they neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you not even Solomon was arrayed as one of these. Um, I, I think of the wonders of the cell. Evolutionary biologists like uh, Dan Grauer tell us genomes are mostly junk, especially the human genome. But this presentation will suggest how genomes are amazing machines, thus affirming the sentiments that even the lilies of the field are arrayed in a way far greater than Solomon in all his splendor. So I've opened with a theological thought, but the majority of my formal presentation will be almost pure science in terms of observation and relevant experiments uh, criticizing the claims of Dan Grauer and evolutionary biologists who are on his side. Uh, maybe one way to introduce uh, uh, the theme of this presentation, uh, this is a slight modified quote from the movie Wrath of Khan. And Mr. Spock says to Captain Kirk, he, that is Khan the enemy, he is intelligent but not experienced. His pattern indicates one dimensional thinking. Uh, the original quote was two, but I think you get the idea. So my strategy for uh, trying to show why Dan Grauer is wrong is his thinking is one dimensional, whereas the modern thinking for the human genome is in four dimensions, at least four dimensions. If we add other dimensions, it's even more. Uh, so we have the 4D nucleome plus the E4 epitranscriptome projects. These are funded projects. These are not just buzz buzzwords. They are, uh, they are funded projects. So this is a quote by Dan Grauer. He said, if ENCODE is right, evolution is wrong. So this kind of sets the, the stage for uh, what I'll be talking about. I'll actually be trying to argue that ENCODE is right. So independent of evolution, we can kind of discuss whether ENCODE is right, just from the science standpoint. Now, uh, ironically, Dr. Sanford said, Dr. Grauer is totally right at his NIH lecture. Uh, slightly different, but that's definitely the sentiment. Uh, just kind of on a superficial level, if we, as, if we just take the number of gigabases in the human genome, uh, that equates to about six gigabits of Shannon information. That's based on the, the idea that each nu uh, nucleotide position is, approx is, is roughly two bits. So that'd be 800 megabytes. If we take Dan Grauer's view that approximately only 10% of the human genome is functional, that would equate to 80 megabytes. Uh, so a rhetorical question, do you think something as complex as a human being can be uh, coded with information as little as 80 megabytes? So that's just, just something to keep in mind. That's the intuitive, that's the intuitive thing. That's the first kind of uh, 
uh, kind of uh, punch I might throw at the idea that the genome's mostly junk. So what is the ENCODE project? It was a follow-on to the Human Genome Project, which completed around the 2000-2001 timeframe. It was headed by Francis Collins. So they found a, a good swath of, you know, they say pretty much all of the genome was mapped. That is the nucleobases in, in the human genome. But they didn't know exactly what they did. So they started the ENCODE project, which had a smaller budget, which was actually not, uh, maybe it was just a pioneering project. And it was actually started by Francis Collins. A lot of people resisted him in, in doing this, but he, he went forward. So that's also his brainchild. Even though his name's not associated with the ENCODE project today, he was one of the pioneers that, uh, that motivated its development. So ENCODE has had a follow-on called the 4D Nucleome Project. Uh, but that's actually not, that's only part of the picture because ENCODE has given birth to other projects such as these. The ENCODE budget, uh, can you all see my mouse here, it was a total investment so far of about $500 million. One of the follow-on, parallel follow-on projects was the Roadmap Epigenomics Project, and uh, also known as REMIC. That was a $300 million follow-on. I don't know the budgets of these others, but they're throwing serious money at this because they're trying to cure heritable diseases. So that is the, this is from the NIH website on the 4D Nucleome Project. And I'll just, these are some things I'm gonna cover tonight from the 4D Nucleome. So what did ENCODE actually do? What got all this started? Well, they wanted to know what, what the genome did, what parts of it did. They had this, they just basically had a parts list uh, when they did the human genome project, but they really didn't have a handle on what the individual parts did. So they just started doing these series of experiments and you have all the, in these blue boxes are the, uh, the names of the kinds of experiments that they would conduct. And this went on, the, the, the people at the NIH would farm this out to laboratories, et cetera. And they just, uh, they were creating what is known as an encyclopedia of DNA elements. That was their goal. There is another project not at all related to ENCODE called uh, uh, the E4. It's called the Enabling Exploration of the Eukaryotic Epitranscriptome. And that is a mouthful, so they just call it E4, E4. So we've heard about epigenetics, which is kind of the extra layer of information that is put on the genome. They're finding there's an extra layer of information also put on the RNA transcriptome. So the genome's DNA, and we have modifications there. The, the transcriptome is made of RNA, which comes from the genome, but it has modifications, and we call those modifications uh, the epitranscriptome. And here is a little diagram of some of the modifications of the RNA molecules, and there's a whole encyclopedia of these too. And there's uh, even known what is RNA editing. So there are just levels to this. This is probably also just as equally interesting, but we don't have the chemical power yet to, uh, and the instrumentation to, to delve into it. But we, we suspect it's going to be a very interesting world. So this is where also where a lot of the DNA that we may regard as junk, it will create RNAs that have all sorts of interesting properties. So just bear that in mind. I won't be able to cover it much in this talk. In fact, I, I doubt I'm going to get through all my slides. And uh, uh, let me check the time. Let's see. OK, you guys kind of just keep me posted on the time. And I'll just go as far as I can. This was from Dan Grauer's university website. He put this on his university website. And he shows a picture of his granddaughter uh, sticking out her middle finger. And he just says on his university website, you know, that the students and faculty could see, says my granddaughter gives ENCODE the, the, the finger. All right, so, so there's this anger there. And he called, uh, he had the, he was calling the people of ENCODE all sorts of names on his uh, Tumblr blog. He calls them crooks. He calls them ignoramuses. He calls uh, one of their heads the scientific equivalent of Saddam Hussein and probably the ultimate insult. 
He calls the NIH director, the founder of ENCODE and the Human Genome Project. Francis Collins, he calls him a creationist. So I just had this little video. Only, it's only a game. Why do you have to be mad? Only, it's all. So he, uh, Grauer, um, and some of his uh, e evolutionary biology buddies put together this paper criticizing ENCODE. It was just terrible. The, the tone was vitriolic. It was unprofessional. It was insulting to uh, many. There were over, probably over 200 researchers involved, uh, you know, from Harvard, Yale, MIT, just all, all these research institutions, including the NIH, and just calling them names. The, the title of the paper is On the Immo Immortality of Television Sets, Function in the Human Genome According to the Evolution-Free Gospel of ENCODE. Uh, th this was very uncollegial on his part, and people had noticed. Uh, another journal called him out on his behavior, and they called him the vigilante, and that was from the journal Science, which is one of the most prestigious scientific journals. And uh, they're noticing this is this is not right. This is not this is not behavior appropriate to a scientist. Someone can be wrong, but uh, he, uh, the way to call him out is not the way Grauer is going about it, calling them crooks and ignoramuses. That's just very unbecoming. Just argue the facts. So the way I frame uh, the discussion tonight, this is evolutionary biologists versus medical researchers. This is not about evolutionary biologists versus creationists. This is evolutionary biologists versus medical researchers. This is a fight people like Dan Grauer had started. So what did he have to say? Um, his 2016 archive paper said, if 80% of the genome is functional as trumpeted by ENCODE project consortium, then 50 45 to, uh, then 45 to 82 deleterious mutations arise per generation. For the human population to maintain its current population size under these conditions, each of us should have on average three times 10 to the 19th to five times 10 to the 35th children. This is clearly bonkers. Uh, just an amusing anecdote, doesn't have anything to do with this. I, I was pointing this out on internet discussion forum and I said, that's kind of bad that uh, a, a human female has to have 10 to the 35th kids. And someone interjected, well, what's the problem? What's the problem with that? By the way, the guy who said that is a uh, psychiatrist and he's an anti-creationist psychiatrist. Sorry, I just had, that was an anecdote. Uh, had nothing to do with anything, but it's just a little humor. So Dan Crower concludes, if ENCODE is right, evolution is wrong. And as I mentioned, Earlier, uh, John Sanford said Dan Grauer is totally right. So is the question tonight, is the human 90% junk or not? Uh, I gave some already an, um, one reason that I suspect that it's not. Here's another reason that it started to motivate people. Uh, <clears throat> a paper came out It's uh, that's actually cited um, Francis Collins here, Francis Collins paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, 2009, 90% of disease-associated SNPs, that is single nucleotide polymorphisms, which are mutations, point mutations in the genome, 90% of disease-associated SNPs are located in non-coding regions of the genome. Now, uh, correlation does not equal causation, but intuitively, this is raising alarm bells. Uh, that maybe we shouldn't call cause this junk. Call this junk. When I was at the 2015 Encode Users Conference, where there are all these scientists learning how to use Encode data, and they were talking and they're conferencing with each other, I'd hear one scientist get up and say, "Yeah, I'm studying this disease or this particular cancer, and what I find is that it's correlated uh, with uh, mutations in the non-coding regions. They could specifically identify non-coding regions." So that was a story over and over and over again. So that's why there's interest in the non-coding regions. So one can imagine the surprise when the ENCODE researchers were starting to publish and say, hey, you know, we think, we suspect strongly, we're, we're you know, we're, we're confident to declare, declare that we think 80% of the genome is functional. These guys were just doing their job 
And then an evolutionary biologist like Dan Grauer, who had no business meddling in medical research, just started calling all these, calling them all these nasty names. So I, I said, this is a very interesting development. And uh, it, it actually, it did bother me. It, it did bother me. I said, this is, this is not good. Excuse me, I'm having some, I'm gonna move. So there, there is, when we get those outrageous numbers attended the 31st children, it's related to this formula, uh, the Poisson distribution in Kimura's 1966 paper. We're not gonna get heavy into the math. Uh, in the Q and A, if someone really wants to get into it, we can talk about it. Uh, but that formula was indirectly quoted here uh, in in Dr. Sanford's NIH lecture, I call it the bonkers formula, the bonkers formula. Uh, it is also quoted in other papers, and you see it like in Iyer, Adam Iyer Walker and Keith Lee's paper. Uh, by the way, doc, uh, what I what I encourage people, creationists, when they're trying to defend Dr. Sanford's work, I encourage them to say this is not about what Dr. Sanford says. Uh, Dr. Sanford is only uh, one among many geneticist. Every top geneticist on the planet that studies uh, human, the human genome will actually agree that it's deteriorating. That's not isolated. To try to, you know, uh, these internet evolutionists will try to make it out that this is only Dr. Sanford's thesis. It's not. It's many others. It's only fair to point that out. Uh, people like Michael Lynch and Alexei Kondrashov he even wrote a book, The Crumbling Genome. Uh, Brian Sykes at Oxford, Gerald Crabtree at the Howard Hughes uh, Institute and also Stanford University. And last but not least, Nobel Prize winner, Herman Mueller. Now Mueller uh, was the one who came up with what I call Mueller's limit in this journal in 1950. And his limit was the number of mutations uh, had, the limit is one mutation per individual per generation. There's some nuance between the haploid and the di diploid mutation. That's not that important. But compare the limit that he postulated is only one mutation per individual per generation. Uh, Grauer accepts that we, uh, he's willing to accept that there are 10 mutations per individual per generation that are uh, uh, functionally compromising. And if ENCODE's right, uh, it's on the order of 80 to 100. There have been suspicions that uh, it could even be in the thousands. But the point is, even the minimum number is 10 times beyond the Mueller limit. Now, I'm not going to mathematically demonstrate the Mueller limit, uh, as there's a rich literature that's associated with it. I'm just going to argue from intuition. Uh, so just take uh, an intuitive argument. Uh, for what it's worth. It's inexact, it's simplistic, but it arrives at pretty much the same number that Mueller did. So I hope you guys have had something to eat. Uh, these are my favorite, two of some of my favorite foods, tiramisu on the left and a McDonald's bacon double quarter pounder on the right. The ingredients list for tiramisu is eggs, mascarpone, espresso, ladyfinger sugar, spice crumb, and cocoa powder. Could we through random mutation and quote unquote natural selection, evolve it into some other uh, list of ingredients for another recipe. And you all probably know the answer, but I'm just gonna walk through this exercise. So uh, by the way, this is Herbert Spencer on the right. He uses the word, he's the one who introduced the phrase survival of the fittest, which Darwin himself adopted in his later versions of Origin of Species. So let's try to uh, do this by a process of random mutation and natural, quote unquote, natural selection. So I'm just gonna do kind of like a very simplistic population here. So let's say that the original recipe is this and we'll call it the parent in the first generation and the parent has children like this. Except the children have mutations like that indicated in, in, in red. So the problem is, what happens if natural selection takes place? Well, <laughs> we're gonna select only from the best of the worst, so to speak. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter what we pick, all of them have some defect. I'm just gonna pick uh, child number two as the fittest. 
And child number two will have her children. And these children will inherit uh, the parents' Hi. mutations Hi. and the each of the children will have their mutations. So we could see the mutation is not being filtered out by survival of the fittest. Uh, and the mutations will accumulate. There's hopefully no point in continuing. We know the result will be just a total mess. So the question is, could we evolve the ingredients of tiramisu to some other set of ingredients? I hope the answer uh, is clearly no. Um, there's some subtleties to this. If we have an average mutation rate of say one per individual, uh, that would imply we could have some with no mutations, some with one and some with two. The Poisson distribution covers that. Um, so uh, when we work through the numbers, we end up getting this table here so that we could at least, you know, if we had a certain average mutation, diploid mutation rate, we could estimate how many females at minimum we would need, uh, even assuming 100% efficiency of selection to uh, keep the genome of that species from de deteriorating. Uh, that was based on Kimura's bonkers formula that I pointed out earlier. So for even with just one, uh, each female would need to have 5.4 kids and for two it'd be 14.7, so on and so forth. And uh, da uh, Dan Grauer pointed out for 80 mutations, uh, each female would need to have 10 to the 31st kids. So I'd like to just pause here if anyone would um, uh, like to have any comments uh, before I move on. So that's just setting the stage. Um, and any questions from uh, anybody, I guess, on, on the panel? Yeah. I'm, yeah uh, I'm just fascinated by the talk so far. I mean, just how um, it sounds like so many people have underestimated the functionality of the genome. I mean, if, if less than 2% of the DNA actually codes for proteins, you know, what's the rest doing? And, and kind of has, as, as you hinted at near the beginning, um, Sal, like a lot of these non-protein coding RNAs are now known to regulate uh, virtually all levels of gene activity in, in the genome. I guess one question that I would have is regarding the criticizers of ENCODE, how they will criticize the definition of function that ENCODE used. Because as, as you, were, you were talking about how ENCODE, um, the results suggest that over 80% of the genome is actively transcribed in, into RNA, suggesting some type of function and, and activity. How does one respond to um, that type of criticism? What I do, I mean, me personally, I don't get into definitional arguments over function. I, I really just try to avoid it. I said, do you, you know, this is all a red herring. Um, the, the, the point is, do, do, do you think it's going to be a good thing or bad thing to have this change? And that's, that's, you know, over time. Right. And, and what I said, I don't even try to argue that the whole genome is functional or 80%. I said, what's so bad of saying, what's so bad about saying we don't know? Is it such a terrible thing to say this is a working hypothesis? Because we have all these medical researchers, like I said, 90% of the heritable diseases are, are indicated in the uh, non-coding regions. So let's just have a look. Why do they have to be called names? Why do they have to be called crooks and ignoramuses? This is so degrading. And these guys are trying to save our lives. So that's what I'm taking issue with. I said, this is a lot, you know, this whole thing about, you know, this is maybe not a nice thing to say, uh, but maybe I'll say it anyway. Uh, th these arguments, when they start, this is like throwing up red herrings when you don't have really a case. Right. When, when the data are really saying something that should get your attention and they're trying to suppress more investigation. I mean, what is the harm in trying to learn more of how the genome works? And, and, and so what if someone is mistaken? It's not like evolutionary biologists have been right all the time. So, <laughs> I mean... Uh, so, so that's how I would argue it. I say I'm not even going to de define function. Let's just, just let's just keep looking. Let's try to keep understanding. Let's keep running experiments and finding because we're trying to solve cures here. 
these these are just sideshows. These are just total sideshows that are irrelevant. So sorry, I get I'm quite a bit more animated today than I was on Friday talking about the origin of life, because I think this is a gross injustice to uh, to the scientific enterprise and medical research. Yeah. I, I think you put it perfectly. You hit the nail on the head when you say it's a red herring. Um, you know, that's exactly what it is. I mean, it can't be a bad thing that we're finding more function in the genome. And I guess um, one other question I would have before we move on to someone else who may have a question is, um, you, you spoke a lot about, um, you know, Grauer there and his claims that I guess w with his most recent paper, I think it was in 2017, where he was saying that no more than 25% of the human genome can be functional. Um, is, is he saying that based on like, um, with the mathematics that, that he's looking at, is, is he using like an, a deep time evolution starting point? Because he more or less, is, is he talking about that in order for human populations le uh, levels to be sustainable, um, no more than 25% of the human genome can be functional because of the effects of, of harmful mutations? Like the more functional the genome, the, the quicker uh, the genome would degenerate, I'm guessing, because the more functional it is, th th those neutral mutations would be more so nearly neutral. Like, can you expand on that a bit, Salvatore? Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, I can't because I stopped reading him. And, and, and this is also not a nice thing to say. It looks like the scientific community is not publishing his garbage anymore, really. That's good. He's, he's relegated to publishing on these uh, internet archives, not getting in peer-reviewed journals. And I don't, I don't blame editors for not wanting to touch his stuff because it's not relevant. Um, how does that cure help us cure cancer or heritable disease or diabetes? R really? I, I mean, if I went to a medical researcher, is he, is he going to care? And I could tell you I've hung around enough uh, ENCODE researchers, uh, not ENCODE, but NIH researchers and scientists. They don't care about what Grauer has to say. They never cite him in any of their research or their lectures. He's irrelevant, <laughs> He's irrelevant. Right. And, and, and you, you know who's actually given him relevance, unfortunately, it's the creationists. We, we, need to start, we need to stop, we need to start ignoring him. And unfortunately I had to give him some space here just to give a little bit more drama. Yes. But he, he, he's, I'm sorry, I, I'm gonna offend a lot of evolutionary biologists, but their work is irrelevant. It is so irrelevant to these questions. I don't know why these guys are doing all these phylogenies on, you know, this creature evolved from that um, when it, it doesn't really have a lot of relevance to what uh, the mission in medical research or biotechnology, it really doesn't. Uh, so a quick, quick question for you on the, uh, on the phylogenies and such. To me, when I look at that, the entire concept, it's almost like they're coming up with hypotheticals of Oh, well, if all of these changes happened, then it could be this. And is, is that a fair, uh, I mean, I know there's more to it, but to me, it's at, at the core, that seems like what is, what is going on there. Um, I, I wish I could answer your question. I've given up. I, I feel I've wasted too many years of my life studying evolutionary biology and I've studied it also at the graduate level. And, uh, I, I'm, I really wish I could have answered your question. No, no. It's, 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 the reason I uh, I bring that up is the, you know, is you're going to be I know you're going to be diving in much more detail on, on yeah. this, this topic here and, and the, you know these the details here in just a second. And to me, when I when I listen to and this is more in like in the internet atheist debates and such, when I hear them making these arguments, I'm like, you are literally putting forth a hypothetical and then extrapolating based on your own hyp uh, hypothetical situation or scenario. And I'm like, how I can come up with anything that can hypothetically end up in this, especially when, you know, we talk about things of, you know, uh, you know, you know, my, as you know, I've discussed my backgrounds in, in technology and software and such. And I'm like, yeah, well, I, I guess in theory, I could come up with a scenario where all of these different lines of code modified and ended up in a new function. That's irrelevant to whether or not it's a plausible uh, supposition to be making. And, and worse, it's not testable. There's no way to really test it empirically. I, I mean, it may be just the best phylogenetic tree you can come up with. And it, it sort of quote unquote makes a prediction. Like I could make a prediction. If we evolve from bacteria, 
there has to be some creature in between a bacteria and a, a human being. So I'll, I'll just pick a, 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 a eukaryote that has some similar genes. It's like, well, yeah, prediction fulfilled. It's not much of a prediction. I mean, so anyway, can I, I'm, I'd like to move on maybe to the more interesting stuff. So thanks for the questions. Could we save it for later if there were any more? Of course, yeah, and, and I want to say um, I really appreciate you answering those questions, um, Salvador. So yeah, continue on. All right, so back to Mr. Spock. He said the, you know, the opponent is intelligent, but he's thinking in one dimension. So we have to think of DNA in multiple dimensions and four D nucleome, as the, as the uh, as 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 the phrase suggests, is looking at DNA in three dimensions and also in the time dimension. And one way to look at DNA, it's, uh, d we tend to think of DNA and it's in the textbooks is you'll often see DNA is a blueprint for life. Well, really it's only, it's, it's a blueprint for the proteins of life. And I actually would, uh, people are beginning to suspect that a lot of the heritable information is in the cytoplasm and even in the membranes, but that's another, it's a story for another day. Um, I mean, it really could be that DNA is just scratching the surface of the in information capacity inside the cell. Because if you include the cytoplasm, it's going to be gigantic, especially the sugar molecules. And they're talking about sugar code. People can Google the sugar code. Um, so we may have only hit the tip of the iceberg. But that being said, 4D nucleome, if we look at DNA as a scaffold, as a material, as a physical material, to park molecular machines, we begin to see how things could be functional. Because up until then, we've just been thinking of DNA as coding for proteins, maybe some regulation. But uh, now when we start to think of it as a scaffold, it's different. Another metaphor, and uh, as imperfect as metaphors are, these are the best that could, I could come up with. We can also think of DNA as uh, designated parking spaces with addresses. So you see these parking spaces have names to them. So the spelling of the DNA letters is important because that serves as an address. So think of it as address spaces. Um, in DNA world, we call that names, uh, we call these things motifs. So these are motifs that machines will search out for to park the machine. Uh, and I'm going to illustrate that. Um, most of uh, the panel here probably is familiar with chromatin, but for the, the listeners here, I'm, I'm going to have to uh, cover some basics about DNA. In organisms like humans, uh, eukaryotes, we have an architecture like this called chromatin. Uh, so this is how our DNA is organized in eukaryotes. Uh, bacteria do not have this form of organization. So here we have a chromosome. And if we start to pull it apart, it, uh, it unwinds into these wires or these strands called chromatin. And chromatin is composed of DNA, excuse me, it's composed of DNA that wraps around uh, this, this bead-like structure called histones. So DNA wraps around things like histones. So it's like a bead, it, it, people will refer to it as beads on a string where the string is DNA and the beads are the histones. And you can actually see here the DNA expanded out. Is everyone okay with that? Uh, uh, now feel free to stop me as I go through these slides because they uh, are technical. If I miss something, please uh, please ask me a question to, to clarify because I sometimes will misstate things. So we have this, uh, you, you'll notice this, uh, it says here, this methyl group, that is a modification on the DNA. It's like a little post-it that's stuck on the DNA. That is what we call that is one form of the epigenetic mark. It's an epigenetic modification. It's just like adding a little extra chemical there to the DNA, that's one form. Another form of the epigenetic mark is uh, changes. We can add little chemicals, like little post-its to the tails of these histones. So you have these histones here and you have these little tails protruding and we can add chemical markings to these. These are uh, epigenetic markings. Uh, let me cover the methylation marking here a little more. And this is all related to uh, the discussion about making uh, if DNA is functional. So we have here a cytosine, cytosine molecule, and it can be modified by a methyl group. 
there's some question whether some of the other molecules can be modified too. Uh, but uh, so far, uh, the cytosine is like the dominant one in our literature. So we can add a uh, methyl group. And so this is, if you imagine the red here, is that's the DNA double helix, and you can have these little methylation marks. So this is reminiscent of uh, random access memory. By the way, the name epigenetics, I believe it came from this gentleman here, Waddington. And here's another picture of uh, some epigenetic changes. I will say this, I don't like the word epigenetics anymore. At the time that it was coined, they didn't have all the um, chemical details. So now that we have the chemical details, we don't have to call it, we don't have to call it epigenetics anymore. We can say, okay, this is a methyl modification on the cytosine, methyl modification on DNA. Then there's no confusion about what you're saying. But this is a little introduction to what epigenetics is all about. Unfortunately, there are a bazillion definitions of epigenetics and they don't agree with each other. So I'll, I'll try to just be more specific. So I'd like to show what happens with these methylation changes. This is a uh, box A here. They're able to make these uh, very interesting graphs where they, uh, I believe they use uh, luminescent proteins that would, or antibodies that would bind to the methylation marks and then you can illuminate them. So we have uh, a zygote here and it's at the stage where the, the dad's DNA, the paternal DNA hasn't yet mixed with the maternal DNA and you can see the methylation marks by the illumination there. And that's at three hours from after fertilization. At eight hours, at six hours, it looks like this. But come at eight hours, notice the paternal DNA has erased. It's 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 like done a reboot of its methylation marks. See that? Hope that's clear. And then uh, sometime later, uh, it, it continues. And then uh, when it <clears throat> when the cell enters the the zygote enters the metaphase, you can start to see the I guess these are the chromosomes starting to break apart and they're gonna do their thing. Ignore the middle panel, that's just the control region that kind of makes the diagram confusing, unfortunately. But then when we enter the two cell phase, you could see the changes. You could start to see the uh, maternal DNA that is methylated um, merging with the paternal DNA. And that this is the two cell phase. We get to the four cell phase and you could see the DNA, um, the methylation marks turning off. So what does that remind you of? That reminds me of random access memory. It's almost like a punch card. Uh, in fact, some of the diagrams that list the methylation marks between cells looks like this. These, I got this from, uh, I, I know uh, some people will say, well, where's your citation? Just Google it. It's if you search far enough, you're just gonna, it's just gonna, you're gonna get, keep, keep getting all sorts of material. And I often quip, whatever I say right now is probably five minutes obsolete because the, the field is moving so fast. So you could see that the methylation markings are different between different kinds of cells. And from the stem cells handbook in 2013, they use the word, Random access memory for epigenetic memory. Random access memory. So that's, I, I used to get flagged on that. They used to say, Sal, you're just making stuff up. And so I Googled real hard and had to look, and there it was. Other biologists were thinking uh, the same thing. So great minds think alike. I, I kind of rubbed it in their face. Um, so here is also some visualization of how this epigenetic memory, this random access memory. So this is really amazing. DNA is considered like a read-only memory, but there's a layer of random access memory on top of it. So uh, we have three-year-old twins here, and these are their methylation marks. And then we have 50-year-old twins, and you could see the change in their methylation marks. So I'd like to pause if anyone had any questions or comments. I hope those were interesting pictures. Uh, I don't know if you've seen them before. No, I, I think it's, uh, once again, it's, so much fascinating. Uh, I, I find the function of the genome so fascinating, just as you were talking about chromatin, how these, these non-protein coding RNAs from introns actually influence gene expression by modifying uh, chromatin for the audience sake, as, as you explain that 
um, complex combination of, of DNA, RNAs, and proteins, right, that make up chromosomes. But uh, for me, no specific questions, just once again, so much fascinating um, information. And John, Jason, Praise, any, any questions or comments from you guys? Yeah. I'm just enjoying listening. I had a question, but I'd forgotten that as usual. But, uh, yeah, I know I'm really enjoying it. I'm really enjoying watching and, and learning about this. And there's a lot of new terms in there that, that you know, that I want to write down later and get timestamps and stuff. So I was really enjoying it, Dr. Cordova. You're doing a really good job. Well, thank you. I'm only Mr. Cordova right now. Um, <laughs> but I, I, do have, I do have five degrees, though, so... <laughs> <laughs> I, I have kind of a broad education, not, not special. Oh, like oh, oh, Dr. Cordova, sorry. <laughs> Mr. Yeah. Cordova is fine. I'm not offended. Yeah. No, um, I'm sorry. No Any need to questions? apologize. <laughs> if no, if there's true. no more questions, we can let um, – I yes, do have a question. Do you prefer to be called Salvador or Sal? Just call me Sal. Sal, okay. 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 Uh, it's Thank nice you. to be called Sal. Uh, my detractors call me all sorts of names, so it's refreshing to be called. <laughs> Same, so, yeah. Well, you're uh, doing a great job so far, Sal. You can uh, continue whenever you're ready. So this is chromatin. So I covered the, the methylation. That's one form of epigenetic change. The next form of epigenetic change will involve the histones. So these are the histones. These are beads on the string. I like this beads on a string. So just think about it. This is random access memory with beads on a string. I'd like to compare some of the historic man-made memory with this. So uh, on the left side is what I call God-made random access memory. This is actual, this is a picture of chromatin right here in an electron microscopy. So you see the beads here like that. And you can barely see the wire. That's the DNA that's between them. So that's beads on a string. That's God-made memory. I'd like to contrast that with man-made memory. There was an old 1950s core memory that used magnetic core. It still sort of looks like beads on a string. And even farther back in ancient times, we had kind of beads on a string. There's sometimes they actually did use strings, not just uh, wires or sticks, uh, beads to have memory. That's an abacus. So that's kind of, uh, I, I, I'm a very visual person. And so it, it, I just found this compelling personally. So I call that God made uh, random access memory. Um, this is another depiction yeah, wow. of chromatin. I'm sorry. I said, yeah, wow. I said, that's amazing. You know, that, that, the, the way that that's set up like that, that, that just couldn't be anything other than made by a creator. <laughs> Isn't that cool? That, that just yeah, amazing it is. It's amazing. Yeah. The yeah. Lord, it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> I think the Lord has a sense of humor. I, I just, yeah. I just, like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's, sorry. Well, we'll go on. I, I'm glad you're enjoying it. So the reason I had this other picture, I wanted to highlight some of the more fine features of the histone. They're actually, uh, uh, the histones come in pairs. They're identical. And so there are four identical pairs to make eight histones, but we usually kind of tend to think of them as only four. But they're actually eight. And I'm going to, uh, so I'm just going to take what's in the circle and I'm going to um, kind of expand upon it. So this is, these are the histones, but I'm focusing on the tails. I don't know if, let, let me go back. So you see these tails out here? Um, this diagram is going to expand the, the tails a little more. And uh, so like you have histone three here and you could see all the different kinds of positions uh, here on the tail. And they can have these little post-its, uh, chemical modifications. The ME is for methylation, P is for phosphorylation, AC is for acetylation. Uh, I don't see any, there are not too many ubiquina ubiquitinations, but they do. Oh, here's one, one UB modification there. And just, just for completeness, I want you to see how the histone is spelled here, this histone 3. Uh, let me go back one. So you have this histone three. I'm going to spell the protein out in terms of its amino acid letters. It's only less than about 140 letters. And uh, the numbering of the histones is a little unfortunate. It's a little different. Everyone has their own coordinate system. But I'm going to number this histone is uh, this K here, which corresponds to a lysine amino acid, 
is position 27. So I just go from zero all the way up to 27. That corresponds to this one here. Do you see that? I have the orange mark here and the orange mark there. I'm going to show all the, all the machinery that it takes to add a post-it note to modify that. So it's just like flicking a bit. So this is also another form of random access memory. <laughs> we can be flipping bits, which is really cool. Uh, does that mean chromatin is a computer? Some people have sus suspected that, that it is one of many computers in the cell. And indeed, um, they borrow language from computer science. So when we're flicking all of these, we're making these chemical modifications here, we say we are writing, we are erasing or reading the mark. And they have all these chemicals that do it. So we have readers, writers, and erasers, very similar to the computer read write heads in our machines, like say a, uh, like a disk drive, except that the difference is in biology, you have multiple, you have multiple read write heads that are just floating around inside the cell. And it, it what's really amazing, it has to navigate to the right position. Um, and I'm gonna show that just, just for completeness for the chemistry nerds out there, this is how the methylations work. I just threw that in there, but uh, we don't need to go go there. Uh, we can kind of abstract out all the details. So again, we have these we have a chromosome and we have these, we call this complex, we have the histones with the DNA wrapped around. By the way, we also call uh, this little unit a nucleosome, a nucleosome, nucleosome. And by the way, that sounds very similar to nucleo. So when you hear 4D nucleo, these are similar words. So how does it navigate? And uh, so it, these readers, writers, and erasers have to navigate to the right uh, uh, nucleosome particle, the right histone, the right section of DNA. So I'm going to show that. So let's start with chromosome 12 here. Chromosome 12. Chromosome 12, let me highlight it. Chromosome 12 has a section of DNA that we call hot air. So just imagine we found this, we are looking at chromosome 12 and we found DNA that looks like this. And we, uh, we have a name for it. It's called the hot air link, uh, long non-coding or long intergenic non-coding uh, uh, RNA. It's actually a DNA that codes for uh, an RNA. So we call it hot air RNA. So how does this work? So remember, I'm just gonna flip one bit. <laughs> I'm going to flip one bit on a histone. So we start with the hot air, link RNA. It comes out of the chromosome 12. It somehow navigates the chromosome 2 through all that uh, colloquially what I call Brownian motion. That's not, that's not the correct formal term, but it is a, um, it's, it's close enough. It, it illustrates the point. So it's, it's going to, somehow navigate with any, without any active propulsion in the nucleus, in the cell, it's going to find its way to chromosome two. And we actually don't know how it does that. That's, that's so far it's like black magic. Uh, we have some idea, but right now it's pretty mysterious how it can do that. That's an amazing problem in biophysics. <clears throat> so, so that hot air RNA, uh, it'll find a section on chromosome two that has a place just for it. It's like a named address. I'll just call it the hot air uh, space. So that's what I'm trying to illustrate here. There's a parking space just for it called hot air that corresponds for the hot air RNA. <clears throat> when it arrives at chromosome two, it'll trigger the assembly of this massive complex here called the polycomb repression complex two. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm losing my voice. I'm gonna have to take a little break here and let you guys talk. The okay. black wire here is the DNA. That's DNA. And then uh -huh. these are the histones here. So it's going to find the right chromosome. It's going to find the right parking lot uh, on the DNA. It's going to find the right section of DNA. And it's going to find the right histone. It's going to be histone 3. And it's going to find that methylation mark of position 27. It's going to have all that machinery. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah it's so amazing. I mean, like, sorry, standing. Go, go on. on. Oh, go on. 
And, and you were Jared? Are you? Did I get your name? Jason. Right? Jason. Jason. I'm sorry. Yeah. Jason. Yeah, it's amazing how all this stuff, you know, links together like this and and works in conjunction with each other. It, it's you know, it's 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 doing it's doing stuff in the genome. The genome's working. I mean, the genome works on first, second, and third dimensions change over time to make the genome four D and and just the the the, the unbelievable complexity and and just in in in, in a so called simple protein is is mind blowing. It's uh and 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 bits of proteins and just even piece. I mean, for these things to 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 be like this is for anybody to say that that just happened like that. Like like um a friend of ours, Neff, always says Nephilim free. He always says they'll they'll look at a, a pile of compost and they'll say a, a pile of compost is designed, um, but then they look at something like this and they say it's an accident. <laughs> <clears throat> And so, so, Sal, as you're uh, uh, preparing to move on here, the yes. you've mentioned the term machines throughout your entire discussion. Um, something I've run into on a very regular basis when I make the argument about the nanotechnologies and nanomachines that are enabling this read-write-edit uh, process you're talking about, it's immediately dismissed as nothing but just you know random chemical reactions. Is that the, and I, the, no, we're talking about real, real life nanomachines. Um, is that premise accepted inside of academia that yes, these are molecular machines that are doing direct functions rather than just being this, you know, random uh, chemical reaction that's somehow resulting in these uh, things like methylation? Um. If you're at the University of Houston and Dan Grauer's department, yes, the, it'll be a random reaction and, and, and of no consequence. But what's happening is we're actually beginning to correlate it to changes. So that little change that I was describing, that correlates to changing the, uh, the quality of the skin. So depending on how this is flipped, you'll get soft skin like in an eyelid versus hard skin like you get in the soles of your feet. It changes. So this these changes matter. And just because we don't know what it actually does it right now, because we, we're seeing all these enormous number of computations being done, we don't know what it's actually doing in terms of how it develops the organism. But it takes a lot of research. A lot. It, it, it takes hundreds of people to get a really good definitive answer just for that one. I'll tell you this, this modification here is famous. Uh, it took a, at least a year and maybe a staff of 20 people to figure it out. And it was really hard work. And that's just one modification on one histone in the Hox cluster. We don't know, uh, you know, there's so many other regions of DNA where you have other histones and we don't know what those ha those do. So there's suspicion. So, um, Sometimes they're dismissed, but you know how that you know how they stop being dismissed by research. When an experiment proves that this is what it does, the people are silenced. Uh, I wanted to say, um, and th I'm just going to wax a little philosophical here because this relates to, to the book I'm writing. The way that we actually started to learn about this was studying fruit flies. Fruit flies ended up giving us a an understanding for how the human body worked. So how the, the, the fruit fly changed its, uh, it had a number of uh, like bristles or something. Um, the way we could change the number of bristles was changing the corresponding histone here, but it gave us a clue of how all of this machinery worked. So that's why we call it the polycomb repression complex. It affected the, the, the flies, the, uh, the bristles on the flies legs or something. And, and yet it has a correspondence in humans, but it's like, um, Again, this is theological, philosophical. It's like God gave us all these little model. We call them actually model organisms. That's why people, it's like, well, why are these medical researchers trying to solve human cancer by studying fruit flies? It's like, well, we have all these organisms that are simpler that we can kind of break apart and blow apart and do all these cruel experiments that we would never think of doing to humans. Uh, they're just like gifts. So all these patterns of similarity are gifts for medical research so we could understand we're fearfully and wonderfully made. So that's my little mini sermon. Uh, so this is how some of these discoveries were made.
Uh, so, so that's how we're, it may be dismissed today. Um, and I will say even 12 years ago when people were saying this was all junk, I had no answer on the internet, but now it's so easy to fight them because um, research is advanced in 12 years. So that's how I would deal with that argument when they just dismiss it. I'll say, well, I'll, I'm going to wait on the Lord. There'll be something coming up because it's, his, you know, it's to his glory to reveal this eventually. So this has been hidden for 2,000 years or ever since time began. We didn't know all these miraculous things. Now in the present day, we're learning it. God stored it up for us in the 21st century. Well, I just find it, I find it so fascinating that these, I guess the DNA in general, but especially the non-coding regions of our DNA, as um, uh, John was talking about, they do function much like a computer system. You know, and these, uh, I guess the deniers, I, I find that the ones that say, okay, um, you know, the majority of our genome must be junk. No more of it can be functional than 25%. As you've stated, um, Sal, it hinders scientific advancement and it hinders medical advancement. And typically I'll ask those types of people that if all of this is truly junk, you know, if, if over 75% of the um, genome is junk, why is the cell even bothering with it? Because obviously that type of activity would be wasteful of energy and resources and natural selection should have eliminated um, all of this wasteful product so long ago. You know, do you find that there could even be an answer to such a, a question like that, Sal? Um, no, I, I, I don't. Um, I try not to answer them anymore because they don't even have the same story because some people say this is neutral evolution. Others will say selection. So they can't even get their story straight. What's right. the point, you know? Point. And, and whereas uh, what ended up happening to me, I, uh, you know, it was really part of my job to study this. I said, what have I been missing out on? When I saw this like four years ago, I, I wanted to say hallelujah in class, but I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I, and then I'd tell my friends, I said, wow, this is, this is amazing. We never see this discussed on the internet, if the, you know. And, and, and so now th this is why I'm very grateful for you guys. You've given me an opportunity to share this. Uh, oh, sad wow, we're enjoying it. Yeah. We really appreciate it. We're really just, enjoying it. it it's amazing. Sorry, no, no problem. I just, I find it amazing because what we are dealing with is a highly compressed DNA code that's beyond the best computer code. But um, I guess those that reject that type of um, thought process, they are hindering themselves from such fascinating discoveries. Because just like you said, this has been hidden for 2000 years. And just maybe 20 years ago, 30 years ago, a lot of um, yeah. the pro evolution arguments had to do with the junk areas of our genome, pseudogenes, ERVs, the ALUs, for example. But now all this research, paper after paper after paper, suggesting that these aren't just leftover remnants of viral infections or genetic mistakes. I mean, these are functional DNA elements, oftentimes uh, important to sustain healthy life processes in the cell. So we can, we can bow down and say, you know, praise God for this. But um, the ones that want to reject that idea, yeah, they're just... Um, hindering themselves and hindering scientific advancement, uh, mostly. It, you know, my favorite... Yeah, no surgeon no surgeon ever went to a book of evolutionary origins uh, to brush up on surgical techniques before a difficult operation. You know what I mean? Like, it's... Uh, yeah, so it's ridiculous. It doesn't help anything. It's just a huge waste of money. I mean, billions and billions of dollars that could be put into researching actual cures and doing actual good in the world instead of wasting it on, you know, rubbish you know, fairy tales. Yes. And, uh, yeah. Exactly. Um, so one of my favorite proverbs is, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to search out a matter. God has concealed this for us to discover. It's just amazing. So we live in a very, very special time. I mean, Christians yes, would have longed to have seen what we see. We're, we are so blessed. Um, if I can, I'm going to point out some things. Of course, take your time, Sal. So, so the importance of the DNA sequence is that it gives a name. It gives names. So the sequence is important. And this will, this will relate eventually to repetitive elements. But I, I'm going to point that out. 
and it's very important for addressing uh, that you, we have the right spelling. So th the spelling matters. And you could see, you can kind of guess that um, how does how do the readers, writers, and erasers, how do they find the right location on the protein? It has to be spelled right because that's how it's going to navigate there because otherwise it's going to grab another protein. So there has to be some uniqueness in the addressing. And this th that's why the C, there's certain sections of protein that really, really, really count. You cannot be modifying these willy-nilly because if you start to change even the, the uh, uh, amino acids in between, like between 28, number 28 and 38, that could mess up the ability of the reading, writing, and erasing machines to locate. See, I, I'm just pointing that's looking farther down the line. So the sequence is important. Yeah, here are the readers, writers, and erasers. Now, I showed a really simple uh, chromatin uh, computation with the I was, I was just modifying this one, okay? I've seen the diagrams get ever more complex. So I saw one like this. I said, you know, I wanted, you know, evolutionists wanted to debate me on the emergence of eukaryotes. So I threw this diagram up. I said, okay, so archaea has kind of like a pseudo chromatin, but eukaryotes, it's really special. For eukaryotes to do DNA uh, transcription and translation, they have to do stuff like this. That that's not even doing. That's just to get it getting it off the ground. Because if there's a double stranded break in DNA, it has to go through all these histone modifications and coordinate them. Huge. And I said, do you, do you really want to debate me on this? <laughs> that the, you could have a system that was just all DNA, and then now you have chromatin. You have to have all these machines to do all the what they call remodeling and all the cross signaling. Uh, uh, that debate lasts about one minute, okay? So that's why I like debating the, um, I probably would have a very hard time debating Erica because my specialty is not on the high end like um, um, primates, but uh, I like debating the low end of the uh, so-called phylogenetic tree. I said, this is how I would prosecute that. I'll say, how did this evolve? How did chromatin, <clears throat> How did the chromatin system evolve? Because you need a minimum complexity to be able to even do DNA translation. It's nothing like it in prokaryotes. And uh, that debate lasts about 30 seconds. Sorry, <laughs> just had to point that out. That's why I love chromatin. So now, if we do a calculation of the number of, uh, you know, we can do a calculation based on the number of um, histone modifications, the number of histones per nucleosome, the number of nucleosomes in the entire genome. And when we tally it up, we have about 80 megabytes of random access memory implemented in the histones. Uh, I'm not even including the methylation marks on the DNA. So I calculated it to be 80 megabytes. Little did I know someone else <laughs> made that same calculation. I calculated 82 megabytes. Someone else said, 80 megabytes, so close enough, right? 80 megabytes, that's the name of the um, uh, the journal and the title of the article, in case anyone's curious. Barbara Bryant uh, at Constellation Pharmaceuticals, when she published this, she argued that chromatin is actually, it's a com it, it, the entire system is Turing complete. That is, it can actually act like a computer. So every cell is a computer, but if you say, okay, every cell is a computer, and it has random access memory, and there are 100 trillion cells. If you work out all the total memory, that's 10 to the 21st bytes of epigenetic random access memory uh, that be modified in a human. It can be used in the human brain also. So the human brain has huge amounts of memory. That's only a fraction. Uh, this, this, is, this is the epigenetic, the genomic and epigenetic memory. It's going to be dwarfed by the glycome, and I don't ha have even time to cover that. So we are fearfully and wonderfully made and let me see. So <clears throat> I'm going here, and I'm gonna um, um, I'm I'm gonna take a pause at, at, at some point because even though I have tons of other slides, maybe I'll save that for another talk. But uh, so uh, he is intelligent but not experienced. His pattern indicates his pattern indicates one-dimensional thinking. So I'm showing you a little bit more of uh, a little different dimension of thinking. So what about endogenous retroviruses. So I'm going to highlight that. 
So let's say the endogenous retrovirus is here. Um, I think my slides are tad out of order. Look at this. This this is a machine here called Cap One. So how uh, it's interesting how the names of all these machines come together, but they're usually very short names. Cap One. Cap One is a very important machine. It is a it is a master regulator of the genome. And you can see here, we have the CAP1 has to indirectly attach to the endogenous retrovirus. That is why the ERVs are important. They, they are probably designed, um, yes, they do end up being viruses that can migrate outside, but I believe the original design is that it, uh, it served as something to get this CAP1 machine to locate in the right place on the genome to do regulation. And we're seeing that. That was um, the subject of this article. So you can look that up. And oh yeah, this was, so uh, let me see. So th there are more articles that, that, that talk about how the uh, endogenous retrovirus through the process of, of being connected to machines actually serves a regulatory purpose. That, that would have been easy to miss 12 years ago. So in the last 12 years, this is all exploding. Now we're knowing how this works. And I see if I can get to the point. Oh, okay, so I'm, I'm, I know what I'm doing. I'm gonna summarize. We can wait and pause a little bit and talk a little more. But what I've showed with the, uh, with the chromatin uh, I haven't even gotten to the, the three-dimensional structure, but this is just kind of leading to toward some things we can talk about in, in the discussion. The physical and data structure of the 3D genome, and I'm going to point something out. <clears throat> These They're talking about chromatin. These exotic properties ne ne necessitate modular, modularizing three-dimensional genome into tree data structures on top of and in striking contrast to the linear topology of DNA double helix. So they're saying there's another layer of information there that's in the 3D, more so than just kind of reading the DNA, you know, from quote unquote left to right. And DNAs make RNAs. We're not gonna cover this. DNAs can generate a neural network. The RNAs are an ideal material to make neural networks. So what we wonder what all these RNAs do, we're only beginning to understand. And I talked about the E4 epitranscriptome. So I framed this fight, <clears throat> you know, between evolutionary biologists and medical researchers. I think, <laughs> I know this is mean. Since they're so mean to me, I'll be mean to them for a change, right? Uh, I think this is more like Bambi versus Godzilla. Go for it. So I'm going to take a pause here. I have more slides, and I can kind of go into more detail if you like. Uh, but if you had any questions or comments, if, or if we wanted to take some uh, comments from our audience who's been so patient to hear me, I'd like to thank you all for listening so far. And your voice is, um, you said you had a sore voice before. Uh, is that, uh, are you okay with your voice? Is, it, is your throat getting sore? Um, no, I'm just getting a little congestion, but um, if you all give okay. me a break. And uh, yes, make yes. some comments. Okay. I should be fine. All right. Well, I'll pass it on to John and Standing because they know more about this than me. So, you know, so, you know, so some of you when you're talking about the random access memory and all those things, so, <clears throat> you're just going as you're discussing that. I think about the uh, and we hear this on a regular basis in folks we debate in the comment section and everything about how you know. DNA is a hor horrible data storage medium. And to me, the things you're, I mean, obviously the, <laughs> the amount of uh, data storage we're talking about here is mind blowing. And I remember reading a, uh, a paper I think about a year ago when they had recently discovered that the amount of data storage in the brain was now expected to be 10 X greater than the previous supposition. And I think it was up to like uh, two and a half pet petabytes. They what they were thinking about just in like in the brain storage. And I remember reading like then there was like a little line at the bottom that said, and th this may not actually 
be a realistic expectation. It may be much more than this. And when I was thinking about it, I went and Googled it. And uh, I think it wasn't until like 2011 or 2012 that there were even 2.5 petabytes of data on the entire planet. <laughs> and the so I thought about that and just was like, okay. And then now I think we're up, it, it's exploded dramatically with, you know, the growth of, you know, video, social media, video based social media. But now I think it was uh, when I did the math, I think it, it took like three people brains to be able to store all of the data on the planet yeah. and then when you think about that in the context of the, of the energy the low level of energy that's required in our brain to store to process and store that much information when you compare that to our best hard drives it's it's it becomes a mind bender when you think about what is actually being accomplished from a data processing and storage perspective um, that we take for granted and yet we have people on the other side arguing that it's crap and is not a good medium and i just, I just find that very interesting and to me uh, this question i have for you is does, do you think this is my position that they are just living in a complete state of denial and refusing to consider how ludicrous the argument is becoming uh, you know, I, I don't know. I try not to psychologize people um, unless I can. I can't really relate to them. I, you know, and I was thinking, what do you guys got to gain? I mean, you're just going to take something, make it a target, and say it's garbage. You're just going to assume it, and you're going to you're going to go all out of your way to claim it is. Just like Grower, and I, I can name quite a number of others like Avice and Ayala, and I said. You have nothing to gain and everything to lose because your reputation is going to get trashed if someone finds out it's incredibly well designed and they're not going to let you forget it. And I'm not letting them forget it because, you know, it's bad enough that they were saying it's just garbage. And that's like from an academic standpoint, just let it go. But when they start trying to trash people's reputations, guys who are medical researchers and trying real hard, uh, I really think that's low. So I can't, yeah, that, that's just really low. And <laughs> so, so they, I mean, okay. Uh, since you're asking opinions for what opinions are worth, I can't prove it. I think these guys are just whining. They're like sore losers. You know, they wanted to win. They wanted to win the bad design argument so bad. They, you know, it's amazing. It's like the purpose of your life, the purpose of people's lives, like Dan Garst, to prove that they're junk. You know, if he wants to prove he's junk, don't let him do it. You know, <laughs> but don't mess with science. <laughs> but that's his purpose in his life. He wants to prove that he's a piece of junk. It's like that's fine. Let him do that for himself. <laughs> <laughs> Calls me accident. That that is a. Uh, it, it is very interesting how it uh, has almost become a. My goal in life is to prove that I have zero purpose and am really a completely broken down piece of garbage. I mean, it's a. Uh, when you really go all the way to the root of the arguments that are being put forth, it's that is what you are arguing at the at the ultimate core, and <laughs> there is no purpose. And then I often wonder. This is what goes through my head many times when I hear these arguments: of then what is the point of even trying to figure this out if there is no purpose, and you, all you're going to find out is how badly something works? Like, you don't don't tell me you actually think that. Why would you go and try and figure out how something that doesn't work very well works? Exactly. See, that's that's Grouch's papers. He says these papers. He's writing paper after paper, saying, "I'm junk. I'm junk." I'm just like, okay, you have, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, maybe you're junk, not us. I, yeah. I find it just so amazing how many of these classic, you could call them, paradigms are, are being changed and completely overturned. Like, as far as I'm concerned, the entire junk DNA paradigm has been overturned but even even that talk of synonymous codons for example um like in short right we've got 20 amino acids four different letters a t c g like there's all these different languages in in our cell and um we're told that there's all this you know redundancy in in the genome and and there's this redundancy in dna coding for protein for example but now we know that those uh, redundant elements, those third codon positions, they don't just tolerate error in the cell. And I, I talk about this a lot. 
um, you know, they're using the different redundant elements to slow and speed the process. So this level of information compression that you're talking about, Sal, into every single letter boggles the mind. I, I find it amazing. And I've said it, I think, two or three times in, in your lecture today. The, the <laughs> The evolutionist, I like how you framed it, evolutionary, you know, biologists versus the medical community, because it's so true. And they're hindering themselves from so much, uh, not only understanding on, on how truly complex the genome is, but just advancements in science, in medicine. It's, it's a real shame is what it is. Um, <clears throat> were there any comments or questions from our faithful listeners? Um, let me see here. I think as I'm looking, I did screenshot a couple. If you guys had any other comments or questions real quick, I'll see if I can find some, or if you wanted to go through a few more, um, a, a few more slides. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so you can also do that. I know you said you had quite a bit you wanted to go through. Yeah. I think I want to cover the ERVs and transposons more. Um, sure. Yeah, we would love, I mean, we love that topic. So far, we, we love every topic you're discussing, so. Yeah, we love that topic, yeah. And and, and really, I should cover, the, yeah, the details of the actual 4D nucleome. I've only yeah. kind of been skirting it, teaching about chromatin, because you need to understand chromatin to understand the 4D nucleome. So maybe just uh, in fairness for the readers, so I, I, I can at least yeah. tell you what. That's it, that'd be interesting. Read. So up until this point, I've just been sharing what chromatin is. And even that is just mind-bogglingly, mind-bogglingly, there's not really a word, <laughs> uh, wonderful. The 4D nucleome takes it to another level. So this is a, <clears throat> uh, an illustration of uh, chromatin. And we have like a gene here. This is a gene. And this is actually not, not to scale. But this explains a lot of things like introns and anything else that's has been called junk. It can be a location where we can get a molecular machine to do computation and work. So there's a lot of computation in the cell trying to figure out what it is and what state it is, whether there's been an injury to my neighbor cell and what I have to do. There's just all sorts of things that the cell has to do. I mean, if you think about trying to build a brain, all the computation that has to be done to be able to uh, like, uh, start to construct something. So uh, John, I believe, was saying just compared to the internet. So just think about how difficult it is to build out an internet, all the decisions that have to be made. So it's, it's kind of, that's what I think a lot of the cellular, cellular computation uh, is directed for. So anything that we have maybe labeled junk, introns, link RNAs, whatever, uh, they can be used as addresses. In fact, this is really interesting. They can be mul multiple roles, multiple roles. Uh, but one of the things is some of their sequences can be used as addresses and then the machines can park on them. And this reminds me of a robotic factory uh, where you have all these machines and they have the tools and they can, it's very much like what I saw in that uh, diagram with the genome. So. Right there is kind of already kind of, you know, it's like this is how DNA can be used. It can be functional. Uh, if it's uh, for structure, it's not just blueprints for proteins. But what's really amazing is this is where we start to get to the 4D nucleome. We have different genes. Uh, they can be on the same chromosome and they can co-regulate each other. So they uh, se segments of of a chromosome can be brought into close proximity together. Excuse me. They can be brought in close proximity together. They can share chemicals and then they can exchange, they can kind of like quote unquote signal, it's not exactly the right word, but they can kind of uh, communicate in a way and they, uh, they can control, they can co-regulate each other. So this is very beautiful here. Uh, it's also kind of amazing how they can actually be, you know, there's not a lot of energy to be doing this, but they're moving, they're moving and reshaping the, the, uh, uh, the chromosome so that the genes can form these little transcription factories. But what really blew my mind 
is that can be done between chromosomes. That was a big discovery, and this was not too long ago. Uh, I don't know when the, uh, the I, we talked about the hot air RNA. There's this F-I-R-R-E, the fire RNA, and it will bring together um, uh, a segment of chromosome 2, a segment from chromosome 15, a segment from chromosome 17, and then a segment from chromosome X. And they're going to get together and do their thing. So this is starting to be, you're starting to see how uh, all these pieces can come together. One thing I should mention, what does this mean? It means that maybe the intron of one gene is going to help regulate uh, the expression. Of, you know, this could be, we don't know, these could be introns that are uh, having molecular machines park and it's going to regulate uh, a gene on another chromosome. That's what we're finding. And this obviously takes a lot of work to find. So sometimes that our detractors will say, well, we have, we have so little experimental proof. And it's like, well, we're not going to find out more if, if we stop the experiments. Because it took 20, it took a staff of 20 people a year working just to get that one link RNA kind of figured out. There are probably 100,000 of these. Okay, so there's not going to be any shortage of work. And by the way, that was only in one cell type. There are hundreds of cell types in the human body, uh, maybe uh, more depending on how we define it. So <clears throat> that's a different way of looking at it. And now I'm going to show something. So we have all these different st uh, cell types. We have like a stem, st stem cell which can differentiate itself into all sorts of other kinds of cells. So we have like cells that are neurons, nerve cells. We have skin cells, I think epithelial, correct me if I'm wrong, someone. We have erythrocytes or blood cells. And then these other kinds, we have car cardiac cells, blastocyst. Uh, I'm not familiar with this one at all, chondrocyte. Okay, uh, apologies for not knowing that. So how does this, how, do, how does it, change how does it change to you know how, how does it know i'm going to be a, you know nerve cell versus a, a cardiac cell <laughs> how do i know that i'm supposed to be a neuron a nerve cell versus a fat cell uh how does it process itself because you could you could tell they look very different well part of that involves the chromatin so the way these chromat uh, the chromatin in a pluripotent cell so this is a let's say this is a pluripotent stem cell, the way that it, it, it forms these kind of loose loops here, and it allows um, kind of a little bit more exchange of uh, chemicals or things going on. But when it gets differentiated to be when that cell becomes either like say a neuron cell or a uh, fat cell, the loops close. And that changes gene regulation. So gene regulation is done by geometry. I believe that sometimes the closing off will, uh, it, it does something, and that's something worth studying. Like I said, whatever I say today is like five minutes obsolete already because the field's moving so fast, I can't keep track of it. But in addition, I should point out what's going on. In addition to all these loop changes, and that's what the 4D Nucleome Project studies, they study the how these loops change between cell types. In addition to that, you have all in parallel happening in the cell are all these histone modifications all along the chromosome. And there, there are a bazillion of these histones in the chromosome that's changing. And then you have the methylation marks on the DNA. So all this, all this parallel processing computations going on to be able to make a, a stem cell become all these parts. And that's how we become from that one zygote into all the, into an adult human that has all the systems that we have, the digestive system, uh, the neural system, just, uh, the immune system, it just goes on and on and on. Just amazing that it could be all packed into one zygote. And here's another one that deals, uh, it's describing how the changes in the looping structure work for um, I, I, uh, for these kinds of cells. I think that those are, those look like kind of related to immune cells. An immunologist is just going to pounce on me for not knowing this. Uh, so we talked about the transcription factories. So I'm going to have to um, talk a little bit about the zinc finger protein to introduce how it relates to these loops. So to understand how all these marvelous loops come together, I'm going to just have to talk about a specific protein. It's called the zinc finger protein. 
So we have DNA and we have a protein that grabs it. That's why it's called the zinc finger and is first characterized in a frog. I think that's a frog. All these Latin names confuse me. Anyway, so we had this protein and we noticed that it would connect to DNA. We call that DNA, uh, a DNA binding protein. So they called it a zinc finger protein. And I'm actually going to show a zinc finger protein. This is what it looks like. This is the spelling of the human uh, zinc finger 136. And I think it's, a, it's only spelled with like 500 or fewer letters, amino acids like that. And the fold looks something like this of this individual zinc finger. I'll, I'll cover it a little bit more so you could see it. So you can imagine, I'm just going to just kind of traverse these individual lines graphically. And you can see how it corresponds to the, this is the actual uh, cysteine residue. The C is for cysteine, H for histidine. So uh, if you just take these letters here, uh, and it would spell like that. Do you sort of see that? Everyone see how I did that? This is, I'm just going to take this line and spell this. So this is a two-dimensional representation of the zinc finger. The actual fold looks like this. Uh, this, is the, this is what the structural biologists do. They obsess on how this is going to actually work. And there's a zinc ion here that, that sits there. This gives it a, this is magic because it, it makes the fold very simple and very efficient. So each of these lines is a, is a different zinc finger. And you, you'll see it when I get to the, some of the next slides with what I'm trying to convey here. So what's nice is you can actually see a little bit of the protein structure. This is a non-random structure in the protein, very obvious visually. Uh, Dr. Sanford taught me how to do that. We call that, I call it skittleizing. So we, 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 name, we can name each row an individual zinc finger and I'll show a picture. So I just put I just put the I just put the uh, letters here on the side, and you could see that each of these is a separate zinc finger. And the way the protein will be is so um, you saw that earlier picture where you had a hand grabbing DNA. So we have these zinc fingers, and th the fold will look conceptually something like this. The protein will actually lay kind of sideways like that. Okay, so every protein has its own fold. This part of the protein will actually lay like that, and it's going to connect to the DNA. Now, this is what's really amazing. This is why it's really important that the spelling of the letters is correct, because this is just like the address. So what the zinc finger, when this is programmed, it's going to find like a few letters here. And the next zinc, zinc finger will find some more letters. It connects. So this acts like an address. So you can see that the spelling of the protein is really, really important because otherwise it's going to grab the wrong piece of DNA. And I've confronted evolutionary biologists. I said, how are you going to find in three gigabase pairs the right section of DNA? How can you expect a random zinc finger? It's just going to grab any random piece of DNA, if, if that, because it may, not, it may have an incoherent array. This is like taking a random, you know, just cutting out a key and that's why actually I was showing keys earlier. Do I have pictures of keys? Yeah, I was saying this is like trying to cut a random key and expecting it to open a lock. It's just ridiculous. So this is an the reason I like this is this is beginning to show the importance of why the spelling of the protein is very important because we're actually now men are trying to actually now start to make these artificial proteins. Uh, these uh, designer made zinc finger protein so they could do therapeutics. And they're finding how difficult it is to even spell just one line. That's not a very long line. They're having an incredibly hard time getting it to spell just, just right so they could grab the right piece of DNA. And it's really hard to get it to all coordinate because these, these zinc finger domains interfere with each other. It's, it's not quite modular. So... Uh, quick, 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 I have a question for you. The yeah. so are you? If I'm understanding you correctly, not only does the sequence for the protein have to be correct for it to fold and exist in the first place, right. it also has to be correct in order for the function of that protein to work 
in relation to it being able to bind with the appropriate uh, location in the DNA, which may be completely separate from the sequence it came from. Exactly. So it, so it has, uh, there's multiple uh, elements of control that is being programmed not in the sequence from both how it is synthesized as well as how it functions. Is that uh, yes. correct? Okay. Yes. So not only do you have to have, <clears throat> I mean, if we were designing this, okay, just hypothetically, if we had even the fraction of the skills that the, <laughs> that the Lord has, we would have to design the DNA string, and then we would have to design the zinc finger that's going to bind to it. Now, that may not be so bad if we're just doing this randomly, but to put this in the context of a working cell, amazing. This is the problem that has to be solved to, to get this to coordinate. And we can't, we can barely, you know, some of our zinc finger proteins are only, the man-made ones are only three zinc fingers. So, so we're, we're, if, where my mind is going with this is, this almost seems like an entirely different level of chicken and egg problem. Yes. The, like you've, you've just added, like, this is like the fourth or fifth chicken and egg problem for life, right? In terms of uh, how it's come to be. The, uh, I'm, I'm going to just move through some other, uh, let me, uh, please keep talking. I'm going to show this a relation to an earlier slide. Um, I, I'm it, not ignoring you. I, I'm trying to. No, no, as, as you're as you're looking for the slide, the uh, something I've uh, and debate I had uh, myself and Neff had recently. Um, one of the things that I was putting forth was, you know, what we're seeing, and I didn't even know about this uh, second. You know, I knew there were multiple subsets of data inside of uh, the code, but uh, I was making the argument that it's like if we were writing a JavaScript uh, function, but it could be multiple functions simultaneously. And how, yes, that would be really cool to do. However, uh, that would be almost impossible for a human to be able to figure out how to do that. Like, you have that number of dual processes going on in their own head yeah. as they're trying to create the code in the first place. Yeah. Uh, and I, 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 by the way, why this is fun, everything I've said, this, this is the tip of the iceberg. I have more slides, but um, these... Remember back to. Oh, the we'd like to see you come back for hours if you could. We we could sit here for five hours, ten hours listening to you talk. If you could talk for ten hours, I mean, there, there's unlimited time here. If anything you ever want to, um, like any books you ever want to push or, or 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 anything, anything you want to, like anybody you want to help out by by mentioning, um, anything like that. So yeah, we we <laughs> we well, we're I, happy I'm to. Sure. But I know I know you can't do that because you've got a sore throat, but. But uh, yeah, we 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 just we have you back any time, as many Jason. times as you want. Have you back every day? <laughs> thank you, Jason. It is well. Well, thank yes. you. Uh, can I tell you just a little as an aside? Um, I had a conversation with uh, Dr. Sanford uh, like last year. He said, "Sal, you're pretty much invisible. No one knows about all the work you've done in the last six years." He said, "We need to pray to 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 let people know more about." what you know yeah all the, all the stuff i've written yeah these are slides i've prepared and you're like the first big audience i've sh shared i've shared it to faculty at christian universities just as the faculty not their students so oh, that's that's a shame because <laughs> they wouldn't understand it like i mean we we you your way above 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 our heads is there's no doubt about that and and uh yeah but it is it's it's good and and I hope that, and, and 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 we don't mind if you have a whinge too. I mean, we're not the sort of channel. Oh, we don't like to get negative. If you ever feel like it, I'm not saying that you, you would, but if you ever feel like it, you're quite welcome. Like you know, as you know, because you've seen us in the comments section. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, it's really, it's uh, we're really enjoying it. I mean, you know, I, I'm the sort of person I'll go back later and I'll watch this thing and I'll take notes and and I'll do a write up on it and send it to Standing for Truth and Matt and give time stamps and stuff like that and and they can they can you know then they'll do something with it and 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 we could put your link um or if you want to give Standing for Truth some links um from people or whatever or books or anything like that that he could put in the description um then that would be uh that would be you know if you wanted to do that as well yes maybe in the future 
So um, I'm glad I could be of service just for, for today, and we'll just see where the Lord leads it. So this yeah, is, and you can use this channel to advertise your whatever you want. Oh, thank you, thank you. I I will take you up on that, and yep. uh, hopefully uh, we as be being happy to part, do of it. The, part of the body of Christ, we uh, we can move forward as kingdom together. So You're helping us as well. I mean, you know, but you being here is a, is a great great help to this channel, and it's a blessing from God to have you here. So we're we're happy for you know. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much you. from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you, and I'm yeah, grateful. But if you, you want to, if you want to go on, you can go on as long as you like, or you can just end it anytime you want, Sal. If you just decide that my voice is getting whatever, you can go on for another two hours. We're happy for as long as you want, or as short as you want. It's all up to you. Um, I think I at least want to do another half hour at least. Oh, great! Well, that'd be awesome. Wanna, I'll just wanna, mute now and let I you go. I want to hammer. <laughs> yeah, I want to hammer the people that've been criticizing the ERV argument. The endogenous retrovirus. I, I just really see oh, I love this that. is great. That um, I, I want to point out one other thing. You see, in school, for people to get to this point, you know, because schools are, you know, when they're training people to learn stuff like this, these are for biologists, professional biologists, uh, chemists, pharmaceutical pharm pharmaceutical researchers, medical researchers. So they have to go through two semesters of general chemistry two semesters of organic, two semesters of biochemistry, then they get to this. What's been encouraging is in the space of what, maybe two hours for people that are, I, I presume, don't have a lot of chemistry background, they can understand this. That's because academia is, to teach this, they're oriented toward, you know, the medical doctors and the medical researchers. And that's, that's great. It's not yet, uh, no one's decided to build uh, teaching materials to teach them about God's works, no. and it can be this can be taught to someone who's like a freshman, and without a lot of science background, it just so. The, uh, the, I feel like you all are kind of getting what I'm trying to say, and w without having to go into all the the deep biochemistry and organic chemistry. So, anyway, the endogenous retroviruses. We need a crab zinc finger to be able to have this complex here. The crab zinc finger, uh, crab is uh, a little extra thing for the zinc finger. It's a specific uh, family of zinc finger. It has to be matched to the ERV. It can't just be randomly there. And it occurred to me, one reason we have ERVs splattered all over the genome if you want to regulate multiple genes simultaneously, this is a really good way to do it, is to put ERVs there. And it's like, you know, this is staring us in the face why it's spread all over the genome and also with slightly different spellings. That enables, if we had master keys and all, it enables kind of hierarchical control. You can group the different gene sets differently with slightly different uh, ERVs. Like if you have a master key, it can open several doors and you can have families of master keys. This is actually the different spellings of the ERVs. They are like different locks. And you can have hierarchical control where you could have maybe one master controller that can go and modify all the ERVs at once, or if you just want them to do sets. Um, that's not in the literature, but I, I, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. That's where the way it's going to go. So um, who knows? Maybe. Uh, it's been rewarding that I can sometimes say, hey, this is a great idea. Let me see if someone's thought of it already. And it's like, oh yeah, they did. So this is this is ERVs. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you a funny story about this. Evolutionary biologists were just saying, oh, these ERVs are random. And then they began to find that zinc fingers would be programmed to, to connect with them. And they said, this is really kind of interesting because when a new ERV pops up, there's a new zinc finger to be right there. So they said, ah, the solution is coevolution, coevolution. And just like, okay, so you're going to, that's how they're going to do it. And I've tried to argue how ridiculous that is because of the difficulty. Uh, that's why I showed this zinc finger array here. I'm sorry that it's so far ahead. You could see the difficulty of reprogramming a zinc finger protein. This is a crab zinc finger protein right here. 
you could see the difficulty of having to reprogram this. If you have a different ERV, you're going to have to reprogram this. And if you're reprogramming this, a mutation in this region or this one is going to make that zinc finger jump to a totally different, different geographical region. Could be a different chromosome, totally far away. It's not going to, yeah, you know, it's not wow, going to. Wow, I didn't know that. Look, it can huh? actually jump like that. Yeah, it's it can actually go a, to a different chromosome like that. Yeah, it'd be a total That's amazing. Mess. So, so, how do they solve it? They just say, they just say, oh, co-evolution. They never actually work through the details. Like I've watched. Co-opted. <laughs> so, so basically, from a uh, computer programming uh, comparison perspective, it's like saying that both the call function and the data that's being called both came into existence at the same time. Or one evolved, uh, one changed first and then the other adapted. And I'm just like, well, that's all well and fine and unless the organism dies in the process or, or, or comparably, what if it's, uh, what if it, what if, I mean, just think about this. Let's say you already have an existing function and you start modifying this and it doesn't bind anymore. Well, that'll cause sickness. We have literature that says, oh, modifications in this zinc finger has affected the, the, the connection. We call it binding. It, it's affected the binding of the zinc finger to the DNA. It's, it's implicated with this disease. I'm just like, well, oh, yeah, duh. That's, you know, you sort of expect that. And so what if you had a gene duplication and then um, you have that zinc finger that has a different spelling and it starts interrupting uh, either the processing of another zinc finger? I said, this is not good. If you start having a gene duplication and then uh, you're having all these random mutations here and this, this machine is jumping all around the genome, this is not going to be good. And I'm just like, it's going to be selected against. What I try to say is natural selection prevents change. It, it doesn't, it can facilitate it a little bit, but it does a lot to prevent change because uh, uh, random mutations, bad, bad stuff. I say bad juju, you know? So um, I'm going to show, this is also related to, this is, this is where it starts to get mind blowing for the 4D nucleome. This is another zinc finger protein. It's called CTCF. This is how it's spelled. And you can see it's not quite as nicely arranged. Uh, you have to sort of force fit the letters, but these are zinc fingers and we've been able to test it. These are zinc fingers in the CTCF protein. And I'm gonna just highlight some other parts of the CTCF protein. There's a region here where other proteins can connect. It's called the shark BSH3 connection. So when, you, when we see proteins connect together and I had some pictures like that with the polychrome repression complex, uh, the, the protein has to have, just like when you have parts in a car, it has, you know, every part has, that may connect to multiple other parts, it has to be shaped right. So here is, uh, this will, this green region will connect to another protein, and then the zinc finger will connect to the DNA. So if you can kind of, I'm sorry I didn't, if I posted that picture of, um, Maybe someday I'll get some pictures. I'll just, if I go through this slide presentation again, I'll know to post pictures. So you can just imagine that this region connects to the DNA, this region connects to another protein. So this is just like car parts. So this is why it's really hard when they, when evolutionists talk about, you know, how random mutation can develop a protein, I just laugh. I said, well, it may be able to develop some random enzyme processing catalytic protein. But if it has to connect to other things, just forget it in a rational way. Because look at all these connections. It has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 specific connections, 11. And they have to be spelled right. So I'm just like, goodbye. This is why I like this. With structural biology, you begin to see why proteins have to be spelled right. So this so, uh, so, so yeah. this. Uh, puts a new, another layer on the uh, supposed synonymous uh, codon argument of, no, 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 it has to be the specific one to result in the correct ultimate binding to whatever part it is ultimately going to connect with. Exactly. So, so let's say 
not that this protein, I know this protein doesn't connect generally to an exon, to a coding region, but if you had a zinc finger or, or any other binding protein that had to connect um, to a specific spelling of the DNA, the, uh, the synonymous change will affect that. It's very well known in regard to um, uh, microRNAs, not so much with zinc finger proteins, but we have literature on the effect of synonymous changes on the uh, gene regulation of microRNAs. And there's, in, I can't believe it, evolutionary biologists are still saying the KAKS ratios, you know, show that these are neutral substitutions or, or the assumption, you know, show that it does this or that based on the assumption of neutral substitution. And just so, like, no, so we, that's so not. So in the context of a microRNA, if the, with this, uh, potentially could the synonymous substitution alter the silencing or, uh, or the different variations of what are happening with microRNAs, could that be, would that alter what the intended uh, modification that's being executed by the microRNA? Yes. Oh, and you did speak about that precise binding. I have a picture here. Uh, let me see. It's maybe way down. I, I'm sorry. I'm jumping around. But I don't know. Be the best way that I can answer your question. Oh no! <laughs> I, I, <laughs> <laughs> it always happens. <laughs> uh, let me let me uh, let me let me bring. What did I do wrong? How do I bring That's that? That's all right. Take your time. Let me. Our see. audience is used to uh, technical <laughs> difficulties. Believe me. So it's it's not a big surprise for them. <laughs> I had. I, do you see my? Uh, did it look like, oh, here it is. Okay. Do you see it says here in exons as enhancers? Does that come up? Yep. All right. So you asked about binding. It just occurred to me, your question, um, John. Um, this is why synonymous mutations can be bad. If you have an exon, an exon codes helps code for part of a that's used to code for part of a protein, right? If it, it turns out molecular machines, this is the dual use. It can be used as coding, or it could be used as scaffolding for a molecular machine when that gene is turned off. So let's say that gene is turned off as uh, for gene expression. It can be used late. It can be used in another context to be a place you can put molecular machines to do gene regulation on other genes. So you remember that, see, remember this picture here where you can even regulate genes on other chromosomes? So just imagine you have molecular machines docking on, a, on an exon that's not presently in use. Isn't that cool? It puts, uh, uh, this is on a much lower level than what you're discussing now, but I remember the first time I, came across the premise that different transcription factors jump from one chromosome to another the yeah uh, to me that was a that was mind bending and that what you're showing us here is taking that to an entirely different level of hey cool we can <laughs> this same thing can have multiple uses even if it's not being expressed in the way that we generally think about it from the layman perspective um it's still having a function even if it's not turned on in the way that you know the common person thinks about exactly that blew my mind and this is where this synonymous change will affect the the what they call the binding affinity if not the entire what they call binding specificity uh so that molecular machine may not be able to park there or park there with enough strength or any number of things that could go wrong. So um, I wanted to show you that. So, that, uh, yeah. so that's a, to answer your question. It will affect the synonymous. This idea that synonymous mutations are neutral. This this is just, this is one example that just, that puts problems in that hypothesis. And I'm I'm assuming this also uh, the things that are being discovered now also put even the concept of point mutation into an entirely different perspective. Yes, that... yes, yes, yes to all of the above. So going back to where I was with the CTCF protein, and um, if you if you have more questions, let me, uh, if you'll- uh, No, we're, we're, we're shutting up, go, go, go for it. Um, it. 
uh, it'll bind to this, the central part of the motif, the DNA motif will be like this. It could be a little different on the edges and that's a whole nother story um, that we're only beginning to understand. So this is why you need 10 zinc fingers. It'll need, you know, connect uh, the, in, the interior zinc fingers here will connect to this and then uh, you can have different spellings of these regions. And I don't exactly know how it uh, totally works. I don't think anyone does. Again, I'll point out, you see this, this green region, and I, I should have highlighted it here. Where is that? What row? That was one, two, E, P, Q. So this region here connects to another protein. So you can kind of just, you can kind of guess at the fold of how this thing is, get an approximation. So you have the zinc fingers here, you have another protein out here that uh, called SH3 that's going to connect here. And uh, who knows what, what other things connect around, but how this is relevant. So we had these loops here and the loops were described in Dr. San, uh, Christopher Roop and Dr. Sanford's book, Contested Bones. And uh, it does mention this loop regulation. I, I contributed to that part <laughs> in the loop regulation in, in the book, Contested Bones. So we talked about these loops earlier in cellular differentiation. I don't know that the gene is actually here. That could be, uh, I'm still learning. But anyway, we do know that we have these loops and we have this CTCF. See, that's the protein, the CTCF protein, which was here. Uh, remember this protein, CTCF, and I'm just gonna represent it in red. And this is mind blowing here. So you have the CTCF protein and notice it points this way and the CTCF points that way. So if we are reading along the DNA uh, in some arbitrary direction, you see the green arrows like that, like that. So you could see one CTCF has to point this way and the other CTCF has to point that way. Uh, meaning we could say that the, the CTSCF has, the protein itself has a defined orientation. And the way it does that is uh, the sequence has to be put in, in one direction in the, it's spelled here in the DNA. So the DNA has to have this little motif here put in there in the right way. And then it has to have like the reverse complement put here. So the CTCF will, you'll have a CTCF pair, one that points this way and one that points that way. Otherwise the loop won't form. So there has to be foresight between this section and then this section. It can't be random. It has to be spelled the right way. So when they say these... Uh, uh, and, and it has to be spelled correctly in both directions, right? Correct. So when they say this is a random insertion, Oh, I'm going to give you the best part. Okay. <laughs> I'm spelling it out here. These motifs are inside. Oh, by the way, uh, this involves other proteins like cohesin and topoisomerase 2 uh, B. Uh, that's the protein I study with Joe DeWeese and I published on it. So, sorry, just had to do a little self promotion there. <laughs> that's fine. No, don't be something. sorry. Do it. Don't, don't look. Anytime you ever want to do anything like that, just go for it. I mean, if you want to put a link to your channel, a link to your work, if you've got mm -hmm. any work up on the internet, anything, just just give it to us and we'll do it. It's it's we're not you know motivated by you know like it has to be you know we're not like some other channels where whatever we'll, we're we happy to help you out like that. So promote anything you like. Oh, that's so generous of you. I hope we can work together. That means a lot. Yeah, to I me. hope so. Well, yes, yeah, so. it, it, it it's good. Yeah, and I'd love to get uh, uh, John and Matt and on next time uh, matt's just a bit um busy today because he, he had a problem with his car and and uh he was just uh yeah so but apart from that no yeah there would be so I, yes i can tell you this much you will greatly enjoy conversation with matt he is epigenetics is one of his favorite uh things oh yeah the research and he he is we joke that he is our uh the encyclopedia of the team <laughs> and he, you, you and he could have you, you and he could have very high level uh, conversations about this from a technical perspective, like very high level. You would not have to. I'll put it this way: you would not have to dumb it down for him at all. Wow, <laughs> wow. Well, that's that's great. It's great to meet you guys. So, as headed, this is the killer. 
a lot of these motifs are in sign elements or ERVs. Uh, so, well. so, so are, are, you, are you stating that a core component requirement for the folding that you're describe you're showing us now requires ERVs to be executed? Um, I wouldn't go that far. I'm saying occasionally we'll have this signature inside. It'd be sufficient inside. It's it's also in, it's really in sign elements, um, but it's in a few ERVs. And I have the citations. Oh, I put it somewhere. It was in the slideshow. I mean, I know I just blasted through it, but one of those did say CTCF. ERVs had CTCF in it. CTFs CTCF binding sites. So there are a few ERVs that have it, but they're they're in the sign elements. They're you know they're in these transposons. I haven't even covered the lines. Say that for another time, maybe when Matt's around. But this is what's killer. So to have all these, um, you know, when you're having all these loops and they're saying, oh, these transposons are just randomly put out there. There's so many of them. Why do you have so many copies? Why do you have millions of copies? Well, they are nice targets for the CTCF protein. And the CTSCF protein uh, coordinates with cohesin and topo isomerase, and they make these loops. And these loops are important for regulation and cell differentiation. So I said, you know, we wouldn't have had this. We, I, we were totally defenseless for the last 20 years. These evolutionists were just saying ERVs are junk DNA. They're parasites. S see how quickly it's turned around? Someone's fighting for us. Someone quick, up here is fighting for the creationists. Quick, quick, yes, question, for you. quick question for you on this. The... Um, so very often we hear about the fragmented ERVs. Um, please tell me that some of these binding sites have been found in the ERV fragments. I, I can't tell you that. I don't know. I, I really don't know. No, uh, I, I was if 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 that was the I, well, I'm guessing we probably haven't discovered a whole bunch of things so far. But I, in uh, a week or so ago, when uh, Standing was debating conspiracy cats. One, he went on this whole tan uh, cats went on this whole tangent about the fragments of ERVs, <clears throat> uh, all of you know, all throughout the genome, and how that was a fundamental example of evolution and uh, the time factor and such. And uh, anyway, it's random Ooh. sidebar there. I, I, if that I, if that had been discovered, that would have been a hilarious uh, thing to know. Of like, oh yeah, and by the way, so the reason there's ones that are fragmented, they're not actually fragments; they're actually binding sites. That would be that'd be an awesome discovery yeah. if that happened to be the case. I, I will say this: I've seen uh, in my gene browsing, I have seen damage to the DNA. I mean, I have seen evidence of real pseudo genes. Um, so um, we are intelligently designed, but also cursed, and you know so. I'm not, I'm not averse to thinking that we share, we have shared damage, that uh, uh, we are created. But then, when um, again, this is theological. This is not science. When man f fell, they probably may have had shared designs that uh, broke the organisms the same way that they broke us. So um, that's just a speculation and. You mean like the animals broke the same time that we broke, or the or, or the maybe, organelles? Did you say? Yeah, maybe the same ways too. In in some. Uh, so yeah, I, I think so know. too. Because, sorry. Oh, go on. Oh no, I just I just heard. I don't know if it's true or not. You probably don't know about this because it's probably not your specialty. But I heard, um, and 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 I'd have to check this out. I don't have a paper for it or anything, um. That uh, there's certain animals like like that have faster generation times than us that are sort of breaking down at about the same speed as we are. Um, uh, I've heard that, uh, but I don't have any uh, actual um, evidence, hard evidence for that. I mean, maybe Matt does, or there's something in the books, but you know, I don't know if uh, you've ever heard anything about that. No, no, no. 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 Oh, okay, so you don't get into that. You just, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so this is just a passing thought, but I, I guess the the general yes. point is, yes. I think I think there's been damage to the genome, and it wouldn't bother me if we got broken the same way certain primates did. Uh, it used yeah. to bother me, but now that when I study the difficulty of evolving one creature to another, I'm just like, eh, you know, 
if I had to pick between one or the other, I'd still pick special creation because this oh, is yeah, especially the more than I get a rat. It's like, do you think this could really evolve? It's too hard to believe. Too hard to be an atheist. I have yeah. zero. I have zero issue with any similarities that are found. To be honest, the this time here. When, when you look at the the point you just made, Sal, of the yeah, this isn't going to happen without direction. Period. At the level, it's just beyond reasonable conclusion. But to me, the whole all it the more complexity we discover and the more intricate you know dependent parts and all these different things that we're discussing now to me that just lends even greater evidence in favor of a creator than evolution to me of like well of course there are similarities why wouldn't there be <laughs> you know of course yeah, like monkeys have a similar body plan to us and a similar, not the same, but similar. And, 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 and if you see certain um, coding regions on, a, on, a, on an end of a chromosome that they say it was 540 zeros, you know, one with 540 zeros after a chance of, but, you know, evolving like, of being like that without evolution or whatever. Well, I mean, duh, of course, because we've got similar body plans and we, we look um, similar sort of creatures in, in a way, like in a way we look at arms and legs. And, and so if we have things that are in, that are in common like that, then, it just screams a common creator, not a common, not a common ancestor. But there's, you know, every, there's. I was looking at there's 60 million gene sets that have been sequenced from organisms in the ocean, and they've only found 12 or 14 that may have a deep branching pattern and stuff like that. I mean, <laughs> 60 million gene sets, and and they only found 14. I mean, these sort of things are just, you know, you have to be a real anyway. You have to be really deluded or, or, or focused on proving God doesn't exist to, to think that, you know, those sort of things like even they're evolutionists even saying now the bush of life and not the tree of life. And, and then that was coined by, I can't remember his name, but I saw the debate was in the great debate with uh, um, uh, Richard Dawkins. And he said that about the 60 million gene sets. I can't remember his name. I wish I could. <laughs> Terrible with names. But, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, 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 it's mind-blowing that people uh, that I, if I hadn't known this stuff all my life, I, I would have had a different life because I was an atheist for a while. Wow. Wow. Um, it just occurred to me I have a few more slides, even though it's not going to be my – Okay. I'll say, I'll say yes. the stuff on Alouz and uh, – Adenosine, okay. inosine. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, please continue on the on the ERVs for sure. But uh, the signs, the, I don't have really good slides for what I'm about to show you. Oh, see, see, it says right here. This is the one. It says CTCF. So the ERVs, some of them have CTCF. I wouldn't say since it's it's kind of like this is kind of an afterthought. So I wouldn't say there are a lot of them that have it. But there was at least a little bit. The more important one is the signs. And I don't have a uh, really good, I have to rework these graphics because you're gonna love, I think you guys are gonna love this. This was actually dis uh, discovered by Francis Collins. Francis Collins and the evolutionary biologist who <laughs> that the NIH fired. Do you all know about Richard Sternberg? Anyone wanna talk about Richard Sternberg and introduce it to the crowd? I. I have brief knowledge of the subject, but I, I don't want to. Uh, okay. I, I know I don't know enough to really describe it. Richard Sternberg, 2004. He is, had a uh, degree, a PhD in evolutionary biology and a PhD in another discipline. He's two PhDs. Two PhDs. He's working for the NIH and simultaneously uh, doing work at the Smithsonian Museum of natural history, I think, or one of the Smithsonian's. And uh, he was editor. He let a paper by Stephen Meyer get published. He was the editor, and they savaged him. They destroyed his career <clears throat> because yeah, he left. Horrible. Yeah. They, they ex like literally escorted him from the building, didn't they? Oh, from that's the bad. <laughs> he did a lot of nasty Are you joking? No, I'm serious. I, the, uh, what? <laughs> at, at least in the version I heard, uh, I, Stephen Myers talked about it. I remember him saying that he 
literally got uh, shown, you know, you know, the whole in the movies, you know, the guy hands you the, your box when you're fired kind of thing. It was that kind of analogy of uh, what happened to him in terms of being the publisher or the uh, editor. Sorry. Yeah, it was mean. There's he, he's an evolutionary biologist, you know, just because he's he let Stephen Meyer suggest intelligent design that was intolerable. And um, so, OK, you know, maybe don't make that mistake again, but you don't you don't kill someone's career over it. It's the, you know, maybe a little reprimand, but not not take his life work away. I mean, I, I don't think that uh, given all the stupid ideas that um, we get from evolutionary biologists, that seemed like a very minor thing because evolutionary biologists are pumping out things that are uh, eventually shown to be false. No one gets fired. So anyway, he got he got punished for that. It resulted in a congressional investigation, but it, it was felt outside of their jurisdiction, but they had special counsel to everything and uh, th th they weren't able to help him. So this was a big deal. So he still kept plugging along uh, and, and thankfully he started, he continued research. He continued research uh, cause he's a true scientist. Didn't matter what the, how bad his circumstances were. He wanted to learn more. He was seeking after the truth and discovery. So this paper by Francis Collin found a very interesting pattern in, in mice and rats. So let us hypothetically, and I, I'm not a baromenologist at all, okay? I, I don't go there, but let's just say hypothetically mice and rats shared a common ancestor. So we're just gonna use that as an, as, as an assumption. So Sternberg and Collins are assuming that mice and rats shared a common ancestor. So just imagine we have this book uh, called Jane Eyre, or some, something Ancestor Eyre, just call it Ancestor Eyre, is the book. And then there end up we end up with two books, one book that has Jane Eyre and the other Mary Eyre. So everywhere in the book uh, called Jane Eyre, where there's the name Jane, uh, the corresponding book will have that name changed to Mary in every passage in the book, all hundreds of pages or whatever. So we would reasonably suspect that the, the two books may have shared a common ancestor, if not one evolving from the other. Does, does that seem reasonable? Sense. I mean, if we were just given this book and then this book, we could make, we could say, hey, you know, we think, we think that there was, uh, it descended from the same idea, not, not physical common descent, but just descended from the same idea you know, at least, at least in terms of as far as book goes, books go. So um, maybe I have to work on the analogy a little better. But what happened was we had, so we had, let's just say we had mouse. Yeah, we had mice and we had rats. So we'll just assume that they physically descended. But what happened was the signs in the mice were spelled one way and the signs in the rats were spelled another way. And what was really bad in this paper that Francis Collins raised up was that they said, well, these patterns would have to assume that the mouse and rat descended from the same common ancestor. And then afterward, the signs in the rats and then the signs in the mice came afterward because this the signs in the mice are spelled differently than the signs in the rats. So far, not so bad. The really bad part, before I get ahead of myself, the really bad part is the position into the same parts of the genome. <laughs> That's what Sternberg found. And the ID community that could understand what he wrote, it started to send, send shivers. They said, this is an awesome they all had. That means that they all had to be related. I mean, created, I mean, um, <laughs> for them to be in the same place, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> this this, this uh, blew people away, and it got it got buried away in some obscure thing. And where this relates is, guess what? Many of these have CTCF motifs that make the chromatin loops. Oh well. <laughs> so I yeah. wanted to end on that, and you know, before okay. I go on, I'm just going to end on that if people have That's great. questions. So this was this was the crowning moment of the transposon discussion. Well, it, <laughs> it was very interesting. Before, before you flip, uh, you went on to the piece of talking. You have your little uh, 
the text there about the global search and replace before that you popped that up that was what was going through my mind of oh did a find replace function <clears throat> in the uh in the code that's literally i kid you not that was literally what was going through my mind of <laughs> right uh, when, yeah. when you were describing that of well that would make total sense if you're just doing that so the so the spelling is different and it was i'm assuming it results in modified regulation is that that we're kind no, of in the variations I think, I think the um I, I don't know so first off i don't know but the suspicion is this is a convergence they have the same function but it's spelled differently now i haven't wow. had a chance to look at the ctcf motifs if they're identical um so uh, so from an evolutionary perspective or evol you know, the evolution perspective you it would require you're saying there it's in 300,000 different locations. Uh, so uh, per the evolutionary model, somehow in 300,000 different places, the exact same mutation had to have occurred. The exact same insertion mutation in the general same location. I, I mean, it's wow. not 100% identical, but this is what this is what they did. They my, minor up. minor variants, but basically, in the exact same spot, for all intents and purposes, right? These hyper specific point mutations, if you will, would have had to have occurred. Right. This is what this is what uh, this diagram is pointing out. And so, if you Google that mysterious sign signal in Sternberg, it's going to pop up. You'll see. And the reason I like this is Sternberg is not a creationist. Uh, I don't know if he is now. But he's a trained uh -huh. evolutionary biologist. This is his bread and butter. He understands this stuff. He knows, you know, that's why it was just so beautiful to read it. I said, this is from an insider. And yeah. Was, yeah. So have there been yeah. any, uh, uh, is this one of those instances where the, the staunch evolutionists just don't even admit that this has been discovered or have they tried to come up with some sort of uh, creative explanation for how it's, uh, possible. This is how they deal with it, and this is why I said watch for the red herrings. They'll say, "Oh, how do you how do you define function?" So the conversation will be about stuff like that. It'll never be about stuff like this because they, they don't want to talk about stuff like this. <laughs> and a lot of them actually don't understand it. This is oh, I, I had mean a, to be mean, but I, yeah, you know, not I'm, be mean as you like. I'm sorry. Be mean as you like. <laughs> So be as mean as you as you would like oh, to. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't realize I was. I did. Uh, I no, got no, you're, problems. You're, I'm sorry. No, you're you're you're, uh, you're Australian. Uh, oh, I see. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I had that. I've been to America uh, twice, uh, once and and LA, and and I've been to uh, Hawaii twice, and I've had people ask me, um, like I said, fly, which is fly in American, um, and and I kept saying fly, fly, and he kept on what? What's a what's a floor? <laughs> he couldn't understand fly, so I had to spell it out. And uh, and then I thought to myself, I went, oh, yeah, fly. And he went, oh, fly, <laughs> you know, like that. So, yeah, <laughs> I can understand you not understanding me. Yeah. So, so a quick question for you. So on these uh, regulatory loops that you've been uh, showing to us, do you happen to know if uh, they're discovering any kind of – so, okay, so the there may be a similarity in – the DNA, but have they discovered any uh, like in between, in between organisms, right? Um, are they discovering any different variations of the actual regulatory loops that are being expressed? I don't know. See, we're only beginning to, that's why the 40 nucleome is just like, it, this is new territory and we're barely able to even understand one organism, which is the human species. This is really tough. We're, we're getting to the point this work is really, really tough. And uh, there's not going to be any end of the work. Um, but I, I was about to say I'm going to be really, this may sound really mean, but I talked to evolutionary biologists. I said, I, I think these are PhD evolutionary biologists. And I'm just like, you don't know that? You mean, you've not heard of 40 nucleome? Or, you know, you don't know. I'll tell you what's really embarrassing. I one time said, uh, you know, chromatin wow. has readers, writers, and erasers. And this evolutionary biologist said, you're just making that up. 
Well, so it's actually interesting you say that. The uh, a couple of months ago, I actually had an interaction with a PhD from Vanderbilt. Um, why, when you're mentioning your friend, uh, the other general, not your well friend, but your Luis, your, your, yeah. your co, your co uh, researcher, the uh, it was interesting. I would, I'd love to have a conversation with him because I forget the guy's name that I interacted with, but um, PhD in human genetics at Vanderbilt. And he and, I, he and I had a conversation and there was a plethora of things that I was bringing up to him that he didn't know. And my, I was, my mind was rather blown because I don't consider myself to be any level of expert and different things I was putting forth to him. I'm like, you're a PhD in genetics and you don't know this. <laughs> that was kind of what was going through my mind of how is this possible? And the, it, what was really yeah, and my at the time, what was coursing through my mind of was, are have you been put? Do you have blinders on in the context of what you even consider to be reasonable uh, trains of thought in uh, in your research? It was kind of what was going through my mind. Sal, just quickly, Sal, are you tired because you said that you'd end there and you had a sore throat before? I mean, if you like, we can end this and we can go on um, another time. But if you're happy to go on, then that's fine by me. But I think that, you know, because you had that sore throat and everything, it's it's what what do wow. you want to do, Sal? Do you want to end it? Uh, no, um, I, I wanted to take any audience questions. They've been so patient. Sure. And can I get a question in? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, Jay. Yep. What's up, John? Amen. Thanks. Thanks for let. Yeah. Thanks Amen. for letting me in, guys. I appreciate it. Oh, no problem. Yeah, just to go a little off topic, but uh, I know I'm probably beating a dead horse here. Uh, you had mentioned the chirality problem to snake. I know this is a big, big problem in the atheist community. They don't want to discuss it. If you could give me some points on that. Um, the major protein problem that they're having with selecting all left-handed amino acids. There's a lot of denial. And I figured, you know, you're... Uh, probably pretty well versed in that area oh thank you for asking and, and who am i speak who am i speaking with uh i'm i'm tony hey tony yeah um, real pleasure to talk with you man really appreciate it there is some um uh, the, the evolutionists will say they they have literature that proves that uh you know it, it can be solved uh, that's not completely honest because life solves that problem. So, so there's definitely chemic, there's kind of chemistry that can solve it. There, there's not question about that. It's whether it can happen in a real context. So the homochirality for amino acids, yeah, we do have some reactions uh, where um, we, we, we have reactions where we can get uh, all 100% left-handed or all 100% right-handed when exposed to a catalyst or whatever. Right. And, and they'll have these papers and say, look at this. This proves that it'll happen. And <laughs> well, it's an intelligence that you, added the catalyst and then stopped it at the, you know, that's right. funny. Would, would, would you say that that's a controlled laboratory environment or does that relate to the early earth in any way? Well, well, that's the first line of argument, but then I found one paper that called them out on it. It wasn't written by a creationist. It was written Right, but origin of life researchers, which is always the best. We love our, we love evolutionist yeah. citations. Uh, yeah. We love them. Love it. And I, uh, my other lecture uh, on Friday, my other talk, uh, actually cited it. Uh, I can't pronounce the Russian name, Konstantinova or something. And anyway, but they said, you know, the problem is, is you have one catalyst that's going to make them all left, and another catalyst somewhere else that makes it all right. So right. what happens is if you have all these catalysts mixed together in non-controlled conditions, what do you get? A mess. You'll get, yeah, you'll get a racemic, which racemic means, you know, mix of left and, and right. So that's so, the first problem. This is just amino acids. It gets really bad with um, – I wouldn't say it's a knockout proof of creation, but it's, it's, it's making it tough. The, the next – would you say, I'm sorry, but would, would you say, because they always say that we're the ones that are in denial and being very dishonest when it comes to the chemistry. But would you say that in order to prove abiogenesis, you would have to start with a random pot of chemicals 
I would say the atheist is being totally dishonest. And these origin of life chemists that are, that are selecting the exact molecules they want to be in their experiment. So, of course, it's going to be successful. I, I, you know, I think they're being dishonest with themselves. I think some of them are sincere. They sincerely believe. I mean, a person can be deluded and not believe what he's saying is a lie. Um, there, there are people that know what they're saying is factually untrue, and they'll do it anyway. That's definitely a lie. If someone's just mistaken and deluded, I try to cut them space. But um, uh, can you state your question again? I, and help me with your name. I, I'm terrible with names. Oh, oh, just uh, Tony. 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 Yeah. So what was your question again? The uh, severity, how, how serious of a problem is the chirality problem? And in other words, the atheist is always calling us dishonest when it comes to the chemistry. As far as the, you know, they're, 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 I, I'm, I'm accusing them of starting with the chemicals that they want. In other words, yeah. they're always selecting what they want to be in their experiment, intelligently guided. Okay, if I were defending the argument, I would say it's serious, but not quite yet a deal breaker. Although it's really close to being just like enough. Yeah, it's it's close enough. But there's one other thing that they don't like to mention is um, even supposing you had all left-handed at some point, and some of these experiment, some of the uh, ways that this can be done is through drying. So the amino acid, one of the experiments is they threw, they had boiling water, they threw the amino acids in, and then they let the solution cool, and then they let it dry, and it would start to crystallize. And, and then it would crystallize either all right or all left. Right. I said that was an interesting experiment. Of course, they don't tell you that, oh, what happens if the ocean washes it and mixes the two back together? That's too bad. <laughs> you lose all the chiral homo chirality. But there's one other thing. Let's say it's enough that you get just a nice little pool of these left-handed amino acids. Well, how long is it going to wait around to uh, connect? First off, it's, if it's in water, that's really bad because it's not going to, it has a hard time uh, connecting to make these proteins or even a proto-protein. But as it waits around, the left will spontaneously flip to right. Right. They switch. It's what they call racemization, and yeah. it gets worse with temperature. So I don't know. You know, there's been some debate how long this can last. Uh, like when meat gets burnt, like the, racemization is, when meat gets burnt by a flame, then it, it binds up the proteins, and that's what's racemized. That's what's bad for you. It's toxic too, isn't it? Yes. And by the way, just as an aside, this is an interesting dating mechanism. Uh, I this is a project I'm actively uh, passively working on when I can squeeze in the time. Right. The racemization state of the fossils at the lower levels, the lower strata, is about the same as the higher. This this makes it look so. In addition to carbon fourteen and collagen dating, we have racemization dating. And this was this was not my work. Someone had done this in the mid '80s, and no creationist had taken it up. And I've said we ought to we ought to pursue this now. If we could just get a chemist to work on this, I, I, I'm I, this year I've been in the process of gathering the data for the Institute of Creation Research because uh, I want Sal, someone to take awesome. off on it. Sal, are you? Would you agree with somebody like James Tor, by the way? Oh are yeah, on a lot of things. Yes. Okay. Hey, so, yeah, I, I you you were pretty direct with Snake. I I, I wish you guys would be. Uh, I don't know, a little more, you know, kind of get to the point with them because uh, the delusional internet atheist just gets away with too much nowadays, I think. Yeah, yeah. and you know, it's good to see Snake humbled the way he was <laughs> while he was speaking to you. He wasn't so cocky and, and cheeky. Yeah. You have the intelligence to put these people in their place, you know, and that's what they need. Yeah. Well, well, you know, the, the, the thing is, is, you know, I just, I'm just going to do my job and say, you know, if, if we get in a shouting match, uh, that, that'll, uh, it's not a good service to the listeners that, you know, no. they want to keep hearing. I want to be able to, you know, so a lot of times I'll just say, listen, you know, we're going to disagree on this. Can we just talk about something else? Cause we're not going to resolve this. So can I talk about another fact? So I was just climbing up the stairway of life. So the homochirality problem for amino acids is, is really, really bad. I wouldn't call it a deal breaker. The homochirality for nucleotides is really bad. It's homochirality and uh, being able to form them. 
I mean, it's, you know, with amino acids, it's maybe left or right. With the nucleotides, it's like combinations, you know, when you're hooking them together, it's like 16,000 different combinations for just two nucleotides. 16,000, 16,199 ways to get it wrong. One way to get Whoa. it wrong. That's just the first two. I said, just try doing that for a, a polymer of 10. So let's say you're trying oh, yeah, to yeah. 10. Okay, you could see well, the next, Yeah, it's just nasty. And well, it takes to make a building to build a working protein is in, and and <laughs> and just a working anything is 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 amazing. I mean, it, I've watched Stephen Meyer, um, you know, give the math from Doug, Douglas Axe on on things in detail and that, and it's absolutely mind blowing. Do you do you know about the uh, the, the uh, RNA on clay? There's a lot of atheists that'll bring that up. But I, James Tor was saying that the clay is chemically prepared in a way that would yeah. never be found in nature. Well, 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 there's there's the other thing that homolinkage thing that I described. Those yes. RNAs have to be the right chirality. The nucleotides and the phosphate group has to be put in the right position. Uh, the six, there's sixteen. Six, if they have uh, an adenosine um, monophosphate linked to a cytosine monophosphate somewhere in that RNA, which almost this will be inevitable. There's 16,199 ways to get it wrong. They had to pre-prepare those RNAs and it's really hard to get that right. And in addition to what James Tour did uh, in my talk, I've referenced the work of a physical organic chemist, that's her specialty, Change Tan. Uh, and she went through this and said, well, this is exactly why it's so hard to build this in the lab. We have to use living organisms to help us build this because we can't just make our own chemicals and start building it from scratch. We don't have the technology. Um, when they're trying to build their own DNA um, where you didn't have a template like you do in biology, if you had DNA, if you just had like, say, you wanted to um, like Craig Ventner was doing was trying to get it from a computer and then we just build it from scratch in the laboratory with beakers or whatever, they could only get 60, 65 or so uh, DNA bases together. They couldn't get like the half million that you need even for a minimal genome. 65 they could stitch together and they had to use all sorts of chemicals where you'd get the reaction, you'd put the chemicals there, you, you'd, you'd stop the process, you'd change the temperature, put a different set of chemicals, and you build wow. one nucleotide. And then you go to the next nucleotide. Wow, how does process. that happen in nature? Right. <laughs> it's not. That's amazing, yeah. man. That's incredible. And, and, that's, so you, and, and, and what's really bad is that assumes you have the right nucleotide to start with, where you have the right phosphate group with the right... Uh, um, so who uh, who selects those molecules just to get that experiment going in the first place? The intelligent chemist. Am I yeah. wrong? Yes, and they're not that smart relative to uh, the one who made it for original biology. Because <laughs> yeah, God. When he did it for biology, <laughs> that's that, that's, it's almost laughable because it goes <laughs> – these things – you know, it's really funny. They could get it to 65 and they, you know, they didn't have very good proofreading. After that, they had to sort of give up. But what was really, there's some other problems. If you just let DNA just sit there in water, it has all sorts of nasty reactions, uh, depurination, and then, you know, just spontaneous breakage. And uh, uh, that's why you have DNA repair mechanisms in your body. Because in, in your body, there are 3,000 depurinations every day. And yeah, we've gone in no your, time. Your body would be blowing apart. And yeah, I, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd be just, curious to, to uh, see you debate somebody like Aaron Ra. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's pretty much the uh, internet atheist leader. Oh, everybody knows him. I had him. an exchange with him once. It was polite. Wow. And, and he, polite? And he was, I'll really? Tell you, can I share <laughs> That's win? amazing. I'll, I'll tell you. You how want to hear about this? Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry uh, I cut you off. Sorry. Oh, I'll share how that one went. It was only a, it was a cordial 10 minute exchange. And I was ex identifying myself to him. And uh, <clears throat> I, I was saying, you know, uh, I work for John Sanford, who, um, um, you know, he invented the gene gun. He's, he's, he's very famous. He's an applied geneticist and he, he's a creationist. And Aaron Ross said to me, Oh well, you know, maybe I could teach him about evolution. I just, I just like, okay, this is not going to work. Yeah, <laughs> denial. He said, he's going to he educate said, everybody. Why don't, he's why, don't, why don't I send him? Why don't I send he's, you? Yeah. He's a used car salesman. Huh? Yeah. 
He's a used car salesman. He sells used used cars. <laughs> more like a more like a clown. Yeah. Said, Why don't I send you a uh, a PDF file and you could share it with Doctor Sanford, you know, and he'll, he'll understand why evolution works. <laughs> and I can't explain how I said he used to be an evolutionist. He's a geneticist, you know, a big fraction of the gene. He just ignored everything I said. Yeah, yeah. You're gonna, you're gonna. It's amazing. You're gonna teach a Cornell professor that he do doesn't understand this stuff. Yeah, who invented the gene gun for yeah. plants? And I mean, it's like, yeah, I know. It's it's so arrogant, isn't it? It's, it's it's we we bump into that sort of thing all the time, and we post stuff, um, you know, in detail and explain it, and and you know we get the evolu we, we in our papers we I mean in our books we use mostly evolutionist links and and we explain it in great detail, and they just they just you know you, you, they accuse you of all sorts of things, but yeah, it's amazing how they just turn a blind eye to just about anything that you know they won't even look at it. Well, you know, I want to cut some slack. To I mean, there's some, you know, uh, there, there are people that are, you know, maybe the Lord will turn them around. But then there are you're people, right. Uh, yeah, there are people that are diehards, just like the Pharisees. They could, they you're could right. see, <laughs> they they could I, see I Lazarus raised from the dead, and they'll try to kill him. You know, a lot of logic in that. You know, and uh, when I was an atheist for a sh for that time, I, I persecuted Christians, not badly, not beating them up or anything, but just you know calling them names and stuff like that so i understand where uh where evolutionists are coming from and, and atheists and i know how they think because i lost my my um uh, my, my faith when i was 10 over the vestigial mm -hmm. tailbone you know with images of swinging through a tree and uh with my tail and yeah and then it was like till a lot of time later so yeah we I understand what you mean hey so a quick so, question for you yeah. some of it uh <clears throat> the stuff you were talking about earlier on the uh, the addresses. Um, I remember a while back, I, I forget where I learned, I read this, but uh, they were talking about proteins that are exported to other cells um, also have uh, addresses uh, built into them. Is that uh, is that is that correct in terms of like where they end up in a completely separate cell? Or a different part of the different system. Yes, and and uh, I have a two minute video that will. I mean, if you're interested, it's only two minutes because it can explain uh, it. Yeah, better. if you wanna, yes. Let me share it. Oh my goodness, this is yes. why this is why prokaryote cannot evolve into eukaryote. Right. Um, so let me get it. Uh, let me see. I'm gonna share my screen and praise. Thank you for helping me out here <laughs> and hanging yes thank you praise he does a wonderful job of, i'm gonna get myself a nice computer soon and, and he's gonna teach me how to use it so i'm gonna I can give him a break <laughs> he's, he's really helps out a lot praise i am that i am yeah just take your time dr cordova as long as you need to get the the thing up the video up sorry Uh, can this screen be shared? Um, hey, pr praise! Is it? Uh, um, you out there sharing? He may have stepped away from his computer. Uh oh, he might have gone to. I don't know what time it is where he is. Uh, uh, praise you! Oh no! Yeah. Oh, he must have thought we were. He might have. Oh, he must have thought we were. Um, he must have stepped away. The, yeah, he must have stepped away. What a shame! Oh. So can, you yeah. give, can you give us the brief, uh, oh. <laughs> the brief run? The uh, next time we'll play the whole video. Can you uh, give us the brief rundown on that? Because I, I remember when I came across that and oh, man, was, was, was learning about that uh, that concept. It really kind of blew my mind. And what you're you've been talking about tonight on the the addresses of you know the zinc fingers and such. I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about how that how that works. I saw, I think you're on mute. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> we, call, we call them localization signals and we have import and export. And so, um, first off, I, I really, I want to thank snake and all the people that have talked to me that are on the other side. Cause I don't want to, or even Jackson, Wheat. I don't want to, 
trash them, but I, I will point out when they had a bad argument. And uh, Jackson Wheat, one time I said, I said, how did membrane-bound organelles emerge in eukaryotes? Because if you just, <laughs> just, just take the nucleus, just take the nucleus. How do you get stuff to go in and out? And he said, it, you know, yeah. leak, leak, leak in and out. And, and just like, okay, I, I didn't call him on it, but I just like, this is, you know, I'm just going to let that one go. Yeah, that's a, that's hilarious. <laughs> just that one just go. leak in and out. Oh man! You know we're not gonna. I mean, if you can believe that, yeah, and just like okay, we're not gonna. We're yeah, just gonna no have to talk way. about some other things, and and so uh, uh, no hate intended, uh, Jackson. No, 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 no. We I like Jackson Weed. He actually came onto my channel once, and and was some one of the evolutionists did terribly in a debate, and he actually admitted it. So you know, good, good, good kudos to him for doing that one. Good on him. Good on him. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. We we appreciate it. You know, like anyway. So, sorry. Yes. So the reason I can't do that is that it um, the, the the molecules the proteins are actually too big to fit through uh, with diffusion what they call the you know it's just going to yeah. leak out it has to be actively pushed and uh, and um, the video actually went in all the proteins that are involved and there's several of them and it takes energy it takes this GTP and then it uh, it has these m these proteins called m proteins and exporteins and it looks for that localization signal. So all these proteins have to be formatted that go in and out. They have to have that, that motif in them. So this is how you construct, how do all those, if you're going from prokaryote to eukaryote and now you have a, a, um, a nucleus, you have all these proteins that have to go in and out. So all these proteins that were okay in the prokaryote, they all have to be simultaneously formatted with these localization signals so that the protein goes to the right compartment. Um, you, that would entail having numerous point mutations simultaneous or, or uh, some very uh, fortuitous insertions of a nuclear localization in all these DNA regions uh, for no good reason at the same time. Uh, uh, when importines and exportines and uh, these transmembrane proteins emerge, I'm just like, you know, this is, I'd sooner believe in a miracle. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, when you're talking about the uh, the signals there, I remember, uh, recently I was reading some stuff on uh, retrotransposons, and I think that's the, is it the gag protein they have to have in order to go uh, through the portals? Um, I, I think it was. I think there was several other ones. But I remember reading something. It was like the GAG protein uh, has to be associated with it, otherwise it can't go through uh, a portal. And thought it was very interesting in the concept. You know, especially with all the you know the, the Dawkinses of the world and their jumping gene arguments. And I'm like, yeah, you know, there's like all these additional external variables that are required for that to ha what you act as if is just this easy to occur uh modification there's actually a plethora of additional functions that are required to make what you're taking for granted happen it's uh it really is interesting to you know the more we learn the more things you're talking about and they're being discovered how anybody can argue this is all just random occurrences when you're, you know, you were just mentioning the, who knows how many simultaneous point mutations would have been required. And, but your argument from the evolutionary perspective is that it's a slow, steady process, gradual process, but it requires simultaneous execution in order much to change. It's like the direct antithesis of each other. Yet it's being argued that yes, this happened. Um, if you saw me looking to the side here, I was trying to find out the names of those proteins. They have one called Rand Gap. I don't know what that. I don't know what the um, the one with the gag protein does. So that's why we need Matt. He can he can set us straight. <laughs> yeah. Hey Sal, uh, I just wanted to ask you, what would you say are the top three death blows to? Uh, a biogenesis, what would you consider the most serious problem with that, you know, hypothesis? Oh my goodness. Uh, uh, 
top three is hard because there are at least 12 that are really, really hard and they're almost all equal. Okay. Um, and actually homochirality is probably one of the ones that aren't the most severe. So I would say um, the homo linkage one with the nucleotides is really bad. It'll blow away the RNA world. It'll blow away any... That's, that's when you that's, when you bring that up to an atheist, I mean, do they ridicule you? Do they say you don't know the chemistry? You don't know what you're talking about? You know. Oh, I get. Oh, yeah. You can imagine everything that uh, they could say. Uh, one professor used to bully me a lot, and he still does. Um, and he really hates it when I call him out on what he doesn't know. <laughs> and he's a professor. So those are the best. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially when I show him up on basic chemistry, because I know it's probably been a long time since he, he took it. So what's their answer? <laughs> so he'll say it. Oh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell him by name, because he said some nasty things. It's Arthur Hunt. He debated Stephen Meyer, but uh, Meyer doesn't bother with him anymore, so he's relegated to debating me on the internet. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, oh, he had the gall to say, you know, we should, you should go mean, back to politics. I, mean, I feel sorry for him. No, I don't. <laughs> I was joking. I said, I feel sorry for him. No, I don't. Oh. I know my accent. I know my accent bamboozles you. I'm going to actually talk a little bit, space my words out a little bit, because when I string them together with my Australian accent, it must be uh, really hard for you to understand. <laughs> you know, so earlier when you were talking about the, uh, you know, the minimum half million uh, nucleotides uh, for life forms, it's interesting you brought that up. The I did the math one time. I think it was... You know, the, obviously the base of that is four to the five hundredth power. I think that I think that if I remember correctly, I think that translates into ten to the fifty second. And the they tried to argue the person I brought that up to tried to argue that uh, you can't. Oh, that that's not reasonable. I need to take a commercial break. I'm going to shut off my cam for just. Uh, I'll be I'll be right there. Yeah. 